passionless, unfinished, and abandoned. This was how Call of Duty Vanguard Zombies was looked at by the consumer base. It was an unforeseen rock bottom, a fall from grace, and it was looked at with nothing but sheer contempt and disappointment. But why was that the case? What was it that was so good about the previous titles that makes this one look like a joke? In order to answer this question, we need a demonstration from one of the previous titles. And I think there's no better example than Black Ops 2. Black Ops 2 was more than just the antithesis of a single game. It was really the anomaly of Call of Duty Zombies. The game tried to explore ideas that were larger and more complex than that of Black Ops 1 and World at War. Every single map wasn't afraid to take a risk and try new ideas. And when the game had its setbacks, it was never abandoned like Vanguard. And on top of all of that, Black Ops 2 was never the subject of a greedy practice like Operator Bundles and Gobblegums. Black Ops 2 was made with the intent of ambition and sincerity, and it was nothing more than that. It may not be my favorite game in the series, but it's the game that I have the most appreciation for, it's the game that I have the most respect for, and my way of showing that respect and that appreciation is through this video. Join me in this two-hour journey where we cover everything good and bad about Black Ops 2. What better way to start a Black Ops 2 video than talking about one of the most notorious maps in the entire series? I think at this point everyone knows how notorious Transit is, but it was never like that in the beginning. Due to Transit's massive innovations, a lot of people liked the map at launch. But when later maps released and they took the ideas of Transit and perfected it, they realized how bad of a map it truly was. So let's begin with talking about the map design. Transit is the biggest round based map in the entire series. You can combine half a dozen maps together and they will still not match up to the size of this map. And obviously with a map that large, a vehicle was introduced to transverse the map and that would be the bus. The job of the bus is to take you from one safe spot to another. There are five stopping points in total, the bus depot, the diner, the farm, the power station, and town, and they all loop around in one track. Starting with bus depot all the way to town, and then you go back to bus depot again. Every stopping point has important supplies from buildables to wall weapons to perks, mystery box locations, that sort of thing. Now since the map is designed this way, the bus is basically the linchpin of the entire map, which means that if that feature doesn't work, the entire map doesn't work. Now you actually don't need the bus to go from one point to another. You can go through each point by foot if you want to. The consequence to this, however, is that you have to go through fog that is pretty difficult to see through. On top of that, there is a special enemy that is lurking in the fog. What the fuck am I looking at? Denizens will only spawn in when you're in a foggy area of the map and their main purpose is to basically slow you down. What these guys will do is that they will spawn behind you and jump on top of your head, scratching your face. You have to keep knifing them until they die, and if you don't knife them fast enough, they will kill you. You are also able to kill them before they jump onto your head. This is the most effective way to kill them as they gain more health when they start scratching your face. So for example, if they jump onto your head and start scratching your face, it will take five melees to kill them with a normal knife knife. However, if you kill them before they jump onto your head with a knife, it will only take two knives. And it's easy to predict when they're going to jump onto your head because of their screech. I can, I can, I can play the, the sounds. <laughs> <laughs> there is also one more thing in the danger of the fog, and that is the lava. Lava in general is around the entirety of transit, but the mechanic is mostly at its scariest when it's in the fog. If you happen to not have jug, getting through these pools of lava can be difficult without dying. So yeah, the fog is extremely dangerous, at least that is before you get jug. However, if you want to ignore all of these dangers and still hike through the fog, there are things that you can discover. Every in-between area has a sort of distinct place that denizens can go into, and these places have either significant buildable parts 
or they could even have wall weapons. Speaking of which, Transit was the first map in Zombies to conceive buildables. That is, if you don't count the electric trap in 5, but that's more of a portable item than in a buildable. But anyway, Transit was the map that was first to experiment with the idea of buildables. Transit has 8 buildables in total. The Turbine, the Shield, the 2 Traps, Power, Pack-a-Punch, the Wonder Weapon called the Jet Gun, and the NAF card table. Literally everything on the map with the exception of perks and guns are buildables. Most of these buildables have their parts within the area of the workbench, but two of them don't have this. They have their parts scattered around the entire map, and that's being the jet gun and the NAF card table. And unlike the modern maps, Transit doesn't allow you to hold multiple parts at once. You can only hold one part at a time. So, with this in mind, to get parts that are across the entire map, you need a good way to transverse through the map, right? Yeah, here's where we run into problems. Let's talk about our linchpin, shall we? The bus. So the way that the bus works is that it has a set track that it always goes through. The bus will stop at every single stop. It will stay there for a certain amount of time and it will leave with or without you. You virtually have no control over the bus. You can't control where it goes, you can't manually turn it on and off, you can't control its speed, and you also can't control where it parks. There's only a handful of ways that you can control the bus. You can manually turn it off by throwing an EMP at it, and you can make it so that it leaves the area that you don't want to be in faster if you stay in the bus long enough. So for example, from what I know, in town the bus stays there for 3 minutes when it arrives. But if you get inside the bus, these 3 minutes will shrink to 30 seconds if you're in the bus for that long. But other than that, there isn't that many ways to control the bus. Another problem with the bus is its safety. When you're in the bus, the zombies will follow you and they will gain more speed to try to catch up to you. So you still have to be active and try to kill the zombies while they try to follow you. If you don't manage to do that, they will catch up to you and try to enter the bus through the windows, or through the top, or through the front, or even through the doors if you left them open. And again, you can't control the speed of the bus, so if the bus happens to be slow at any point in time, the zombies will catch up to you. And worst of all, there is one wall weapon in the bus, and that's the B-23R. Granted, it's not like the B-23R is ineffective, it's just that it's not the most ideal weapon you'd want in your main form of transportation. And finally, I know I've mentioned this a couple of times, but the bus is obnoxiously slow. Getting to a specific location can take an excruciating amount of time depending on where you are. There's only one good feature with the bus, and that is that you have the ability to install items into it. You can install a ladder on the side of the bus to get on top of it. You can also install a hatch door inside the bus to do the exact same, to get on top of it. And the final part that you can install into the bus is a train grill. You can put this in front of the bus to make it so that zombies don't come through the front. While these items are very effective at upgrading the bus, they still don't solve the main issues with it. The bus is still unreliable at taking you to the locations that you want fast, and it's also completely unsafe. With all of that in mind, most people would rather go on foot to wherever they want to go. And while it may be significantly faster than using the bus, there's still the problem of denizens. Denizens are fucking obnoxious. Denizens are infinite, and when you kill them, you don't gain any points. And every time you kill a denizen, another one will spawn in. And then when you kill that one, another one will spawn in. And then the other one, and then the other one, and then the other one. The only vital use that denizens have is that you can draw them into one of the lampposts and use these lampposts as a teleporter. Throughout the entirety of transit, there's a bunch of lampposts around the map. You can draw a denizen to one of these lamps and the denizen will turn into a teleporter. I don't know how that makes sense, but they can do that. Using this teleporter will send you to another lamppost around the map. The only problem that it really has is that you don't actually choose where to go. It is completely random. And in transit, most of the time you only want to go to one specific area because the resources of this map 
aren't separated equally throughout every area. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go through every single area and see what each of them offer. The bus depot or spawn offers quick revive and the turbine. The turbine is the most vital buildable in this map. When the power is off, the turbine is capable of turning on things temporarily. So for example, you can put it by a perk machine and you can buy the perk and get the perk temporarily. And also the lampposts that I mentioned earlier don't work unless there's power. So you can use the turbine to turn on the lamps and use them to teleport. The turbine can also be used to open up secret doors that get you to hidden areas, and these hidden areas contain parts for the bus. The turbine is also used to power up the two buildable traps, and finally, you need the turbine in order to pack a punch. But that's it for the bus depot, let's go into the diner now. The diner has three important things. The first is the mystery box location, the second is a riot shield, and finally there is speed cola. Farm has three things as well, double tap, one of the traps, and finally, the weapon locker. The weapon locker is a storage unit where you can put any weapon that you're holding except for a couple of ones like wonder weapons, the ballistic knife, and the starting pistol. This weapon will be stored into your account, meaning that you can go into any other match of transit and you can still find that weapon there. The power station has, well, power, as well as a buildable trap and the tombstone perk. Town is the only one out of the five that doesn't have any guns on the wall. It however has two perks being jug and stamina up, as well as a buildable table for the jet gun, the pack punch machine, and finally the biggest clutch on this map, the bank. The bank allows you to deposit points into your account and you can withdraw these points in other matches of transit. I've always felt like the bank is probably the most broken thing in the entire series. Being able to withdraw thousands of points on round one feels a little bit broken, but on transit, that feeling is completely nullified because it makes the map significantly more playable. You can see that the resources are spread quite thin throughout the entire map, and most of the time, you only want to go to one or two locations and that's it. Like, look at farm for example. Farm has only one vital component that you really want and that's double tap. The buildable is useless and the weapon locker is only useful if there's a weapon there. Power also has the same problem. There's only one thing that you really want to do there and that's putting the turbine for pack-a-punch. The buildable trap is again quite useless and tombstone is a perk that not a lot of people buy, including myself. So there's really nothing to power. I think both of these examples shows how the resources are skewed towards certain areas only. And this makes the transversal of the map even more annoying. But wait! it gets even worse. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that transit only allows you to hold one item at a time. So if you want to get either the jet gun or the nav card table, you have to put the pieces in one by one. And the pieces, like I said, are scattered throughout the entire map. The reason that the buildables work this way is because this map was intended to be played with four players that are cooperative with each other. And since both of these buildables require four parts, each player can hold one part and all of you can build them together. But if you're playing with a lower amount of players, God forbid that you're playing solo, this takes significantly longer. But what is by far the worst thing about this is pack-a-punch. To me, the main rules of a map should be this. Power and pack-a-punch should be simple processes that everyone could figure out. And I will give that credit to the power but I will not give that credit to Pack-a-Punch. So in order to Pack-a-Punch on this map, you have to put a turbine here, go to the bank, throw a grenade to open up this door, and then the bunker will be open. Once you're inside the bunker, you have to build the Pack-a-Punch with the buildable table, and then you can finally Pack-a-Punch. Not many people can figure this out on their own, and from what I've seen from people that played this map for the first time, they didn't figure it out either. And putting that aside, this process is tedious. Now me personally, I've never had it where the turbine breaks on me and I can't enter the bunker. And I wouldn't really have much of a problem with this process if Pack-a-Punch was open permanently. The thing about it though is that for some reason, it's only open temporarily. If you leave the bunker and the turbine breaks and you want to Pack-a-Punch again, you have to get another turbine 
go back to the power station, put your new turbine in, and then go back to town to pack a punch again. That is a bit of a severe repercussion for a mistake a lot of people make. And speaking of severe repercussions, let's talk about the wonder weapon of transit. And that is, of course, the jet gun. The jet gun was the first wonder weapon in zombies that had no involvement with RNG. You are given a certain task, and once you finish that task, you get the jet gun guaranteed. And the task is to build it. You have to collect four pieces throughout the entire map and build them in the town area. Building this weapon by yourself or with teammates that don't know the map that well can be a little frustrating as it can take an extremely long amount of time. Now when you take into account that this is the first time Treyarch has attempted to make a wonder weapon that is guaranteed, it makes sense as to why the process was the way that it was. It also makes sense as to why the weapon was the way that it was. So anyway, you've spent 10 to 15 minutes building the thing and then you start using it. What is the weapon like? So the jet gun has infinite ammo, and it has infinite damage. But with a weapon like this, you have to put in some side effects in order to make it, well, not overpowered as fuck. So they gave it some bad side effects. First of which, you can't run while using the jet gun. You can only walk with a very slow speed. Another thing with the jet gun is that it relies on these two dials on top of it. The one on the left is the temperature dial, and the one on the right is the RPM dial. In order to be able to kill zombies with this weapon, you need the RPM to be over 30. And while you're using the weapon, your mobility is slowed down even more, meaning that you just can't pull it out and use it immediately like I'm doing here. You also can't stay in a corner and camp with this weapon because, well, the temperature is going to rise. If you happen to overheat the jet gun, it will be completely separated into its four parts. Two of these parts will lay on the ground, and the other two parts will despawn and respawn in the areas that you found them. It makes sense for the jet gun to have these bad traits because in the end of the day, it's a weapon with infinite ammo and can kill at any round. So to get the most out of this ridiculously powerful weapon, well, you need to know how to use it properly. Now on paper, these bad traits sound reasonable for a weapon like this, but when the weapon is used in practice, you see where the problems rise. Number one, the fact that the weapon breaks and half of the parts despawn and respawn into other parts of the map is such a cruel consequence. The other thing is that the temperature rises way too quickly. If you were to get a fresh jet gun and then just hold the trigger until it breaks, it will take less than 10 seconds to break. With these two things in mind, the only thing that you can basically do with this thing is to chip away at the horde of zombies. If you're someone that plays from round 30 to 40 to even 50, there's really no point in getting the jet gun because every other good weapon in the map kills faster. Part of it also is that you have to know how to use the jet gun in order to get the most out of it. But even after the jet gun's failure, Treyarch never left the idea of an infinite damage and infinite ammo wonder weapon as they brought it back in Cold War as the Dai Shockwave, a weapon that is superior to the jet gun in literally every single way and is infinitely more fun to use. But see, none of that even compares to what is possibly the worst thing about this map. The two easter eggs. So first, let me talk about the idea, which was awesome. So, you would either have to pick between two sides. You either want to do Maxis's easter egg for Maxis, and Richtofen's easter egg for, well, Richtofen. And I love the way that they implemented these two easter eggs. When you first spawn into the match, every character will start hearing Maxis's instructions. But as you progress through the map, Richtofen will only speak to one character and that's Stuhlinger, and he will start giving Stuhlinger instructions for the team. And when you look at the easter eggs of the other Victus maps, they have the same sort of concept. The dynamic of both easter eggs in this map and in the other Victus maps is pretty cool. But, well, the positives end here. The first thing you have to do in both easter eggs is to build the Navcart table. And if you're doing the Richtofen side, you have to build that plus the jet gun. This has to be one of the most tedious easter egg steps I've ever done in my life. It took me and my teammate 30 minutes to do this, and that's with us abusing the bank. Once you're done with your laborious endeavor, you have to take the jet gun and break it under the pylon. Once you're done with this step, you get 25 kills with explosive weapons, and then you get to the AMP step. So the way this step works is that you have to deactivate four lampposts around the map with EMPs. So the way that this used to work is that Every single player in the game, all four players, all of them have to get EMPs from the box. Now thanks to the lamppost teleporters, people found the workaround to this and made it so that it was possible with two players. But 
recently, like I think two or three years ago, people found out a workaround for this so that it could be able to be completed solo. The strategy in co-op is the more ideal way to do this and that is for two players to get EMP grenades. These two players will have a teleporter ready by a lamppost. They will throw an EMP at this lamppost, jump onto the teleporter and throw their other EMP to wherever they land. And once you complete this step, you complete the Richthofen side transit easter egg. It is a pretty short easter egg and while the last two steps are not that bad, the first step is really the one that is just so fucking time consuming. But that was the Richthofen side, let's see what the Maxis side offers. So the Maxis side requires two players at least. Once you turn on the power, Maxis will ask you to turn off the power. Once you do that, you go to the pylon and you put turbines in. From there, one player has to get EMP grenades from the box, and you have to get Avogadro to spawn into the pylon and kill him with an EMP grenade. Once you do that, you go to two different lampposts on the map and put two different turbines and you finish the easter egg. Now, this easter egg is significantly better than Richthofen's easter egg, but the problem with both of them is that they're both so uneventful and so uninteresting, with the Richthofen side being worse because of how poorly designed the map is. But all in all, that ends it for the easter eggs and transit as a whole. Now before I end off this section, I want to add in a couple of fixes of mine. My intent with these ideas is to fix a lot of the problems that transit has without really changing its design too much. I don't plan to give an idea so ridiculous as to, for example, remove an entire section of the map, but I do have a lot of ideas that I want to implement into this map. And also, if any of you guys watching this video have ideas of your own that could be implemented to fix this map a little bit and also other maps that I talk about later on in this video, I would like you to put these ideas in the comment section. I'm very interested to see what you guys think would have made this map better. So the first thing I want to do is I want to expand upon the concept of the buildable items in the bus. All of the items that you can install into the bus are for defensive purposes, but there isn't an item specifically designed for direct offense. Now, my idea would be to take both the turret and the electric trap and instead of making them buildables that rely on the turbine, you have to install them in the bus. So, you would put the electric trap in the doors and you would put the turret on top of the bus. This idea would give the bus way more purpose in the later rounds. However, there is still a problem with the bus being unreliable in transporting you. The fix that I propose for this issue would make more use of the install mechanic on the bus. Make it so that there are items around the map that when installed on the bus will give you more control over it. So for example, you can install an item where you can make it so that while the bus is moving, you can use this item and the bus will stop completely and it will only start moving when you use this item again. You can make another item where you can make it so that you can pick any location on the map and the bus will go there. And finally, the last idea that I have concerning the bus is the wall weapon. So at first it will be the B23R, that's completely fine. But then add a way to change the B23R into a better weapon. So for example, let's say in the hidden areas that you need the turbine for, you can find chalk drawings of certain wall weapons. Let's say for example, you go to the diner one and you find a chalk drawing of the PDW. So you take that chalk drawing and you go to the bus, draw over the B23R, and then now you have the PDW on the bus. Another idea that I can add is to fix the teleporters. Instead of making the teleporters random, make it so that it's rotation based like in classified. The teleporters in classified show icons that correspond to certain areas around the map. These icons change every few seconds. Using a teleporter while it's showing a certain icon will send you to its corresponding area. Like here for example where I use the teleporter while the chair icon is showing up which means that it will lead me to the first floor of the map. If transit were to use a similar system to this then transversing the map will be significant better. There's also the topic of the jet gun. The main fix that I want is to make it so that when the jet gun overheats, it doesn't break. You just throw it on the ground. Kind of like when you have a turbine with you and you pick up a shield, the turbine is dropped, not the pieces of the turbine. Players should not be punished for not knowing how to use the wonder weapon. That is just purely asinine. Finally, the last change that I can think of is with Pack-a-Punch. 
This would be a small mechanic change, but it would make a very huge difference. So normally the way that the power door works is that it's only reliant on the turbine. So if there isn't a turbine there or if the turbine breaks while you're going to pack a punch, the power door just shuts down and you can't use it anymore. My idea would be this. Instead of it being reliant on the turbine, it would be timer based. Say you put the turbine by the power door. What will happen is a timer will start. If this timer runs out before you get to the bunker, then the power door shuts down and then you have to put a turbine by the power door and start this process again. What this will do is that it will make it so that you don't have to get a fresh turbine every single time you want to pack a punch. Oh and also, once you make it to the bunker and you build the pack a punch, the bunker would be open permanently. I think that all of these changes together could make transit significantly more enjoyable because the map is in a severe need of something like this. With the way that transit is now, to get the most out of it, you have to be playing in a four-player game where none of you are taking the map seriously. Playing the map this way can turn Transit's chaotic nature into an extremely fun experience, but a lot of these circumstances are way too specific to happen often. Not many people on this planet can convince three of their friends to play Transit together and have a fun time. And meeting circumstances like this are truly the only way to enjoy this map in my opinion. Other than that, the map is insufferable. With Transit being such an ambitious project that tried to diversify from the main formula, the developers added in a bunch of survival maps to appeal to the classic formula. There were four of these survival maps in total, with one of them being locked behind the paywall being either the Seasons Pass or a specific version of the game, and the rest of the three survival maps were free for everyone. I'll talk about the bonus map Nuketown in a bit, but for now let me just quickly talk about these three survival maps. So these three survival maps weren't actually new maps, they're just three areas of transit bordered up by barriers. Each of these three sub-maps tried to emulate an experience from the World of War maps. Bus Depot tried to emulate Nox's style of gameplay, where there is only one box, and that's it. No perks, no pack-a-punch, none of that. The second area was Farm. Farm tried to emulate the gameplay of Verrucht or Shinonuma, where there is again only one box, but now there are four additional perks being the original four, being Quick Revive, Juggernaut, Double Tap, and Speed Cola. The third and final map was Town. Town tried to emulate the gameplay of Deris or Kino or you could even say Ascension. It had six perks instead of four, being the original four again, plus stamina up and tombstone, and it also had a pack-a-punch machine. These survival maps accomplished three things simultaneously. Number one, these three maps were pretty effortless to make, as they're already parts of transit. They just took these parts and boarded them up. The second thing it accomplished is that it made it so that it was a great introduction for new players. And the third thing it accomplished, it gave people a medium for classic zombies. Now, out of these three maps, it was pretty obvious which one was the best. Bus Depot was way too constrained and hazardous to be playable. And yeah, Noct was also constrained, but there was so many things in your favor. The zombies were way too slow to attack you, so you can easily train around them without getting hit. And in solo, there was a cap of 24 zombies per round, which made rounds go by very quickly. On the other hand, when you look at Bus Depot, you can see that the zombies are way Way less forgiving and you didn't have rounds that go by in the speed of sound. And on top of that, lava is around the entirety of Bus Depot. Not only does the lava hurt you, but it turns zombies into fire zombies, which makes it so that when they're killed, these zombies explode and damage you. Next up is Farm. Farm is way more tame than Bus Depot because of the addition of perks. After playing these two maps consecutively, you really do get a grasp of how important perks actually are. There is less wall weapons and less space overall, but the addition of perks helps out immensely. I don't like playing this map solo at all because I just find it very boring. But playing with teammates on this map is a lot of fun. Farm actually used to be one of my favorite maps to play with random people. The map is so small and it's so condensed, so 
Playing with four players is pretty chaotic, and mixing this chaos with teammates that you've never played before is a pretty fun experience. However, none of these two maps measured up to the popularity of the final survival map, which was Town. Town had the most open space out of the three, as well as a pack-a-punch machine and two extra perks. Town basically had every single main mechanic that people loved about zombies, and it was a perfect place for people to learn the game if they were new, and it was also a perfect place for people to reacquaint themselves with the mode. There was one problem that Town had, and that is the lava. Now, while having Jug makes the lava less of a problem, it still kind of is, because, well, if you get hit multiple times and then you step on the lava, it may not kill you, but it will stop you from regenerating your health. Now, it's not like lava is such a huge problem that it ruins the entire map, it's just that I think everyone would rather not have lava than have it, you know? And I still think even with the lava, town was a great experience overall. But that was the three free survival maps. What about the fourth one that is locked behind a paywall? Nuketown actually had its own gimmick unlike the other survival maps. Nuketown zombies actually had random perk spawns. Now it's not the first map that did that, you had Shanger Law before it, and even Shino Numa in World at War. But the difference here is that there is not a single perk on the map when you spawn in. Every few rounds, a perk will fall from the sky. And this was completely random. So basically, you can play one game where you get double tap as your first perk, but then you can play the next game and double tap is the final perk you get. This only differs if you're playing solo, where the first perk you will get 100% is Quick Revive. On Nuketown, there's only four perks that can fall from the sky, being Quick Revive, Juggernog, Double Tap, and Speed Cola. There's also a fifth item that can fall from the sky, and that's Pack-a-Punch. This perk system defines the entire gameplay of this map. So really, your opinion on this perk system is generally your opinion on Nuketown. And most people resent this perk system. Nuketown is the only zombies map that restricts your use of perks and Pack-a-Punch permanently for rounds on end. The thing also about Nuketown is that it has very small spacing compared to other survival maps. The map is so small and condensed that in co-op it's nearly unplayable. The space that you're given is more suited for solo play, and even in solo you need to be focused at all times because losing your focus for even a second will make you die so fast, it's almost like you were struck by lightning. It's also worth noting that Nuketown has no barriers, so camping isn't a viable strategy. And on top of that, Nuketown doesn't have a safe wonder weapon with you. So when you take a map as difficult as Nuketown and you sprinkle in the idea of random perk spawns, a lot of people will definitely complain about it, saying that it's completely unfair. But other people see it as the challenge that Nuketown provides. Since the map doesn't provide you with with any help for rounds on end, you have to rely purely on your skill to survive. And with the way that the perk system works, you have to adapt your playstyle to the perks that you're given in the beginning. For example, if you're given double tap in the beginning, you have to rely on your weapon to survive because you have very little health. On the other hand, if you get jug first, you have to rely on your movement because your weapons aren't that powerful. And this also adds a lot of replayability to this map. Using permutations formula, there are 100 than 20 different possibilities as to how perks drop on this map. And since this perk system defines the gameplay of Nuketown, every single match of Nuketown is drastically different from each other. There are so many playstyles that you have to adapt to to survive on Nuketown, and Nuketown also has no hazards. No lava that can burn you, no mud that slows you down, none of that. So most of the time when you die on Nuketown, it's because you made a mistake. That's pretty much it for the gameplay of Nuketown. It's, again, a survival map, so there's nothing much to talk about here. One final thing about Nuketown that I want to talk about is that it actually has an easter egg. Nuketown takes place in the same time that the Black Ops 1 map, Moon, is taking place. So as you progress through the rounds, you can hear Richtofen go over his grand scheme. And eventually, on round 25, Richtofen takes over the zombies. Every zombie will now have blue eyes and Richtofen will be the announcer instead of Samantha. And while that's pretty cool, it unfortunately has no effect on the gameplay. But all in all, that was Nuketown. Nuketown is one of these maps that will put you through the ringer and you need to be on top of your game to survive. But since Nuketown's only form of replayability is its perk system, it can sometimes feel a little lackluster.
getting a discussion about the most hated zombies maps ever made, there are so many maps that are way more hated than Die Rise. You have maps like Blood of the Dead, Voyage of Despair, and many more. But what I always found amusing about the people who hate Die Rise is that while the quantity of people that hate it is less than the quantity of people that hate these other maps, the people who do hate Die Rise have a stronger, more passionate hate for it. But I always felt like Die Rise never really deserved the hate that it got from these people. Because I feel like the problems that people complain about are easily trivialized by other factors, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let's discuss the map design. Die Rise is the first map in Zombies with a vertical inclined design, where instead of going from area to area horizontally, you're jumping from floor to floor. Going to any of the lower levels on this map requires precise jumps. Normally these jumps come in three different types. The first one is a precise jump that requires you to land on some mattresses. The second one requires you to fall down slowly ledge by ledge. And the third one is jumping from building to building. Missing any of these jumps can result in either a halt in your progress, fall damage that could kill you, or plummeting to your death. However, jumping from place to place is only reserved for going to the lower levels of the map. So how do you go up? Well, you have to use a different method. The elevators. Once you turn on the power on Die Rise, a lot of elevators will start working around the map. Every single elevator can contain a perk or pack-a-punch. These elevators go up and down on their own accord, so you can jump on top of these elevators and transport you to the direction that they're going. And the last way to transverse the map is sort of a rule breaker, and that's the trample steam. The trample steam is a portable flinger that sends the zombies flying away, and you yourself can even stand on it and send yourself flying away. The trample steam on its own is a great tool to use for camping, but it also doubles as a transportation method. It's a great way to save time on this map. You can place it on certain spots to send you to a certain location that would normally take you walking around the entire map. All of these three factors blend in together to make the first parkour experience in Zombies. And I gotta say, for their first attempt, it was pretty decent. But unfortunately, all of these three factors have their own notable issues. Let's start with the small issues concerning the trample steam. The number one problem that I have with the trample steam seem personally is the fact that only one player can hold one at a time. And because of that, the amount of trample steams that can be placed at a time is directly proportional to the amount of players that are in the game. So if there's only one player, only one trample steam can be held. But if there's four players, each of them can hold four trample steams. It's not like one player can place a trample steam and then grab another one. No, they only have access to one. The issue with that is, is that once you use the trample steam to transport yourself to another location, you no longer have access to it. Now don't get me wrong, one trample steam is still extremely useful. But the fact that the trample steam's usefulness is limited by the amount of players that are in a game is pretty terrible game design in my opinion. There's also the possibility of misplacing a trample steam and then jumping on it and then falling into oblivion. One way that they could have easily fixed this is put in an indicator to show where you would be falling when using a trample steam. But unfortunately, something this easy to implement was never done. But at least in the trample steam's case, you're not really forced to use it. But in the case of the other two, you need them to transverse the map, and they themselves have some pretty big issues. One big problem with the ledges that you fall down in is that you can't backpedal and go back to your previous location. If you want to do that, you have to go around the entire map just to do it. Not not that much of a problem if you're in the middle floors and have a trample steam along with you, but if you're in the lower floors, you're forced to use the elevators to go back. And well, the elevators themselves are a terrible method of transportation. Like I said before, the elevators go up and down on their own accord, and like the transit bus, you virtually have no control over it. You can't pick the direction that it goes to, and you can't lock it down in place. There's really only two things that you can do with the elevator to have some kind of control over it. The first thing you can do is by standing on top of it, the elevator will leave its destination faster. And the second thing you can do is that you can actually call the elevator to your current location. Now that may sound fantastic and all, but the thing is you're required to use an elevator key. The thing about that elevator key though is that almost every facet of it is terribly designed. First of all, the elevator key is a single use item, meaning if you use it once, you have to get another one to use it again. No, seriously, what the fuck happened to my key? Did it like disappear? Did it break? Is there a human being on this planet that manufactures keys that fucking evaporate on use? Now that on its own is pretty bad for its usefulness. 
But the thing is also is that it's placed in such a terrible location as well. So the keys are located in this area here where you have to use the elevator from spawn to fall down into. And the only other way to get back there is by using the trample steam. So if you don't have a trample steam, you can't go there anymore. Another thing is is that most of the time players are either on the roof or in the spawn area. And well, the keys are placed on the bottom of the map. So if you want to go out of your way to get this single use item, you have to go to the literal other side of the map. It's unfortunate because if you put the keys in an actual good location of the map, more people would use them. Like for example, if the keys are placed in the kitchen area on the roof. Or you can even split the keys into four different locations of the map to make it so that people can pick them up wherever they are. Or you can make it so that the zombies drop the keys like the trams in Dreisendrack. Something along those lines would have made the keys significantly more useful, but Unfortunately, with the way that they are now, no one uses them. So you have to rely on these elevators for transportation, and if they're not there, you have to wait for them to come in. And as I was saying before, you have to use these elevators to go back into the previous locations because, well, you can't climb up the ledges that you fell down from. So what problems does this cause exactly? So the first problem this causes is that if you don't have a trample steam, you're forced to go one path only. And even if you do have a trample steam, there are some cases where you can't use it at all. This is especially an issue when you're trying to revive someone in one of the upper floors. Can I use this shit? No, there's no fucking way. I don't I'm think so. I don't think so. That's impossible. <laughs> and this is also an issue with the elevator. If someone is on the roof and you're in the bottom and you're trying to use the elevator to go up and revive him, it's almost impossible to do so. And that is, of course, due to the fact that you have little to no control over the elevators. Another problem this causes is that both the elevators and the ledges can be occasionally dangerous. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna be talking about the fall damage. Here's something that you probably did not expect me to say about the fall damage. I think it's heavily over-exaggerated by the community. I will concede to the fact that die-rise can occasionally be glitchy and sometimes you can die an unfair death. But as long as you're not a dumbass like myself, you will not die deaths like this for example. So yeah, I wouldn't say that it's unfair. The elevators on the other hand are unfair. There has been a handful of times in my life where I wanted to escape to the elevator because there was a bunch of zombies on my back. But it's pretty difficult to do that when the elevator just isn't there. And even if you do hop on the elevator, it doesn't leave immediately, meaning that you still have to defend yourself. Since every method of transportation on this map is dangerous and reviving your teammates can be quite difficult because of these methods of transportation, a solution was made in the form of a new perk. Who's Who. The idea behind Who's Who is what I would best describe as a skill-based quick revive. The rewards of Who's Who are way better than quick revive in every single way. In solo, you only have three quick revives, but you have an unlimited amount of Who's Who's. When you get revived by quick revive, you lose all of your perks. With Who's Who, you don't lose a single perk. And finally, quick revive only acts as a self-revive in solo but in Who's Who, you can use it in both co-op and solo. As you can see, the rewards of Who's Who are better than Quick Revives in every single way. The difference is in the way that both of these perks work. In Quick Revive, the game will revive you automatically after a few seconds of downing, but Who's Who requires you to manually revive yourself. When you die with Who's Who, the game will spawn a clone of yourself very close to where you died. This clone of yours is equipped with a starting pistol, a normal knife, two grenades, and claymores if you've bought them in the game. You are given no perks or no additional buffs for that matter. You don't get an additional speed boost, you don't revive faster, and the only way to get additional health while in Who's Who is to have Perma Jug. The game essentially spawns you with nothing, and it demands that you train in potentially some of the most cramped areas of the map, and revive yourself using nothing but your mobility. It's like being a baby fresh off the womb, and then be demanded that you perform CPR on your dying mother. There are so many severe problems with Who's Who that the developers never accounted for. The first problem with Who's Who is that you basically have no advantage whatsoever when you spawn in. You were already used to your current kit of two pack-a-punched weapons. And normally when you get revived by your own quick revive or someone revives you, you get back these two pack-a-punched weapons. Who's Who breaks this rule entirely and gives you a starting pistol. The other problem with who's who is that the zombies that killed you don't despawn and then start spawning within your area. They are still in the area that you died in. Meaning that if you want to revive yourself, you have to take the horde of zombies surrounding the area, take them away from that area, maneuver around them, and then go revive yourself. There is something that I also forgot to mention about this perk. 
your down self has a bleed out mechanic similar to your down teammates. So in the same way that you have to revive your teammates before they bleed out, you also have to revive yourself before you bleed out. And if you bleed out, you don't die, but you lose all of your weapons and all of your equipment. But see, the thing is about this perk is that even with all of these terrible factors and terrible disadvantages, the perk itself is still not terrible. It's still pretty usable. But the biggest problem that who's who has doesn't even have to do with the perk itself. It's the map. If you were to put this perk in any other map, like Darius, Kino der Toten, Moon, or most other maps in the series, who's who could actually function as a very good perk. But the thing about the perk is that it's only on Diarise of all maps. Now you may be asking, why is Diarise specifically the problem with this perk? Well, it's pretty simple. Most of the time when you die with this perk, you don't spawn in any advantageous location. I did a lot of testing for this, and most of the time you don't spawn in a good location. You either spawn in extremely close by to where you died, meaning that there's a bunch of zombies around you, or you spawn in in an area like this. Like seriously, how the fuck am I supposed to revive myself this way if there was a horde of zombies there? The position of where you spawn in in who's who is so important that the perk is no longer a skill-based perk. It's a luck based perk and nobody wants to waste a perk slot on something that is completely luck based. Look, I have a firm belief with who's who that it could be easily fixed. There's three things I can suggest with the perk that could help it immensely. So I would guess that the reason the developers picked the starting pistol is to have great mobility but at the same time not have a way to defend yourself. And while I like that that's how who's who works, the problem with it is that you're way too defenseless. You have no health buff, no speed buff, and your weapon is completely useless. So with all these factors in mind, here's my suggestion on how to fix this perk. Instead of giving me two hits, give me four, give me the stamina up speed boost, and instead of giving me an M1911, give me an upgraded ballistic knife. Now obviously with buffs like this, I would suggest that you'd also spawn me a bit further from where I died. Like say for example, you died by the trample steam workbench, the game would spawn you on the rooftop, for example. Here's another suggestion that could make this a bit more interesting. Say, for example, if I die with a trample steam, the game would spawn me in a specific location where I have to use the trample steam to revive myself. I think if you were to design who's who this way, it would still be classified as a high risk, high reward perk. But now it's no longer unfair. But the thing about current who's who is that it's way too detrimental and situational to be useful. And who's who unfortunately doesn't fix the many issues that this map has. But remember earlier when I said that a lot of these problems are trivialized by other factors? Well, let's talk about these factors by discussing the setup process. Unlike the slow and cumbersome setup process of transit, Diarise is surprisingly quick with its setup. You can get completely set up on this map by round 4 without even using the bank. And you can do it in like 5 to 10 minutes. This is because of one of the most broken things about the Victus maps and that's perma perks. Now, I chose to not talk about perma perks on transit even though it's the map that introduced this mechanic. I instead decided to talk about this mechanic on die rise, and the reason why is because I felt it was more fitting to talk about it on this map than in transit. But Anyway, what is a perma perk? This mechanic gives you a bonus by fulfilling a certain secret condition. Like for example, you have the tombstone perma perk. It allows you to maintain all of your perks except for quick revive when you down in solo, and in co-op when someone revives you, you only lose one of your perks instead of all of them. The bonuses that you get from perma perks are there indefinitely, but in order to keep the perma perk indefinitely, you have to meet a specific requirement in order to keep it. One example I can give is the extra sniper points perma perk. What this does is that it gives you 300 extra points for every kill you get with a sniper. Meaning that if you kill a zombie with a headshot, instead of giving you 100 points, it gives you 400 points. This is easily one of the best perma perks in the game. One kill can get you 400 points. If you wanted to get 400 points with one kill using an SMG, you have to put in 30 bullets first then you have to get a headshot. Now, how do you get this perma perk? Is it difficult to get? No, not really. You have to just get a couple of long shots. Doing this simple task will give you this perma perk indefinitely until you lose it. Also, when I say indefinitely, I'm not talking about the specific game, the match that you're in. Like the bank and like the fridge, 
these things carry on to other games in the future. But as I was saying, you have to meet a certain requirement in order to not lose this perma perk. The requirement is to not miss three times in a row. If you were to miss three times in a row with any sniper rifle, you will lose this perma perk and you have to get it again. Which is really not that difficult to do. This perma perk is easy to get, difficult to lose, and it turns your sniper rifles into an XP farm. Now when you take a perma perk like this and you go to a map like Dairise, where there's a sniper rifle on the wall, you can now understand why it takes such little time to set up on this map. Another perma perk that helps immensely is the tombstone perma perk. Due to this perma perk, you can get all of your perks, not lose them, and then not have to rely on the elevators for the rest of the game. Because there's pretty much no reason to go to the elevators if you have all of your perks. So once you get all of your perks and all of your weapons that you need, you can now chill out in any area that you want to train or camp in, and you can do that for the rest of the game. And the best thing about this map is that it's rich with gun variety. Die Rise was the first map in Zombies with very good wall weapons. There was three new wall weapons added to this map. The first was the PDW SMG, the second is the SVU sniper rifle, and the third is the AN-94 assault rifle. All of these three weapons are incredibly powerful, especially the AN-94, but I find the SVU and the PDW to be more fun weapons to use, and they're also in better locations on the map. But topping off our gun variety on this map is the new wonder weapon, the Soliquifier. The Soliquifier has to be one of my favorite wonder weapons of all time. It's a weapon that is extremely effective in the hands of people that know how to use it, and I enjoy wonder weapons that are like that. But unlike the jet gun, if you don't know how to use the Silico Fire, it's still a pretty powerful weapon to have with you. And you also don't have to worry about running out of ammo because you have boss rounds. The first boss round we've gotten since the Ascension Monkeys. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Jumping Jacks. It always confused me as to why people hate these things. Yeah, they're unoriginal and it's another Nova Crawler. But in fairness, this is easily the best iteration of the Nova Crawler we've ever gotten in Zombies. Anyway, these Nova Crawlers are extremely acrobatic and they'll just jump all over the place. If you kill all of them normally, you'd get a max ammo, but if you get 100% accuracy, you would get a free perk along with your max ammo. And getting 100% accuracy with these things is so easy that you can basically guarantee a free perk every 5 rounds. All you have to do is either use a melee weapon or claymores or trample steam and you're good. Call them unoriginal and uncreative or whatever, but I just find them so beneficial that I like their inclusion on this map. However, the one thing that I genuinely hate on this map is the map's easter eggs. Like Transit, this map has two sides. You either have the Richthofen side or the Maxis side. Both of them require four players, a full team, in order to be completed. In my Transit section, I mentioned how the requirement of more than one player makes it inaccessible to a lot of people. But at least in Transit's case, you're required to at least have one person. In this map, you need three other people. So the first problem with it is that it's pretty inaccessible. But what about the easter eggs themselves? What is the problem with them? I don't hate any of the diarized easter eggs because they're tedious, they're long, or difficult. That's not my problems. The problems that I have with them is that they're incredibly glitchy. I am not lying when I tell you that every single failed attempt I had doing both easter eggs were because I couldn't progress because of a glitch. I'm not lying to you when I tell you that I had over 10 fucking attempts failed because of glitches. Each of them were over 30 minutes long at least. Okay, look, you know what? Let's just look at the steps. So the first step on both sides of the Easter egg is to step on four different elevators at the same time. With a bit of coordination with your teammates, this step is not that difficult. The next step is to find four other symbols around the map and step on them in a specific order. And the way that you find this order is through trial and error. This one, again, is not that difficult if you have a coordinated team. The next step is to buy an SVU off the wall and use it to shoot two orbs located in the dragon billboards on top of the roof. And this is the first step that I had a glitch with. For some reason, no matter how many times I shoot the orbs, they just don't disappear for some reason. So yeah, that required a restart. Now you have to choose which side you want to do, the Richthofen side or the Maxis side. If you choose the Richthofen side, then the next step is for you to get a Soliquifier and shoot these two orbs until they start spinning. And here's another step that I couldn't do because of a glitch. No matter how many times I shot the orbs with the Soliquifier, they just 
won't spin. Fantastic stuff. Once you get that step to work for you, the next step after is to get some kills with the trample steam, and finally you have to do the pylon step. One of the most infamous steps on this easter egg. On the rooftop on Die Rise, there is this pylon here where all of its four corners are lit blue. You have to melee these corners in a specific order. So how do you figure out this order? Every single one of these corners is facing a direction in the compass, so north, south, east, and west. When you spawn in in a game of Die Rise, there's going to be eight mahjong tiles that spawn around the map. The eight mahjong tiles are within a set of 11 locations. Four of these mahjong tiles will indicate a direction of the compass, and the other four mahjong tiles will indicate numbers from one to four. Every two mahjong tiles is colored in a specific color. Let's say for example that you found the north mahjong tile, and this north mahjong tile is colored green. You have to find a mahjong tile that has a number on it that is also colored green. Let's say that the mahjong tile that was colored green was the number two. So that means in the order that you have to knife the corners of the pylons, the north corner is the second one that you have to knife. Trying to do this step for the first couple of times is extremely annoying, but if you happen to be in a case like myself, where I had so many failed attempts because of glitches, I accidentally memorized every single mahjong tile location. I've done it so many times that I'm unconsciously doing it even if I'm just playing normally. But yeah, doing this pylon step will end your easter egg. Now let's get on into the maxis side. The first couple of steps are the same, you stand on the elevator symbols, then you stand on the round symbols, then you get the sniper rifle and shoot the orbs. But then we get into the booter room step. So in order to do this step, you have to go to the booter room and get a bunch of kills until you get a quote from Maxis. Once you do that, you have to get an upgraded ballistic knife and shoot it at the room and you complete the step. Now, this step sounds really easy, and it is, when it works. So the first part of it is to get the ballistic knife itself. So on our first attempt of doing this easter egg, we got to this part and we just needed to get the ballistic knife out of the box. I want you to guess how many teddy bears I got before I got the ballistic knife. It could have been one, or two, three, four, five, six. I spent five rounds in a row doing nothing but hitting the box and I got six teddy bears just to get a ballistic knife. But you know what was the funniest thing about this? The step was actually glitched. Fun fact about this step, if you buy a bowie knife or galva knuckles, you can no longer do that step. I accidentally bought galva knuckles in the beginning of the game and I completely forgot about the fact that that was even a thing. So after almost an hour wasted, we did another attempt where none of us bought any of the melee weapons and it still just didn't work. And after that happened again, me and my teammates pretty much lost all will to try to complete this easter egg again. Until one day I decided to download the plutonium mod for the Maxis side and do it myself on stream. And then it surprisingly started to work. Once you finish this god awful step, you can now finally move on to the trample steam step. There are four specific lion symbols around the map that you have to place a trample steam on. Then you have to go get these two orbs that spawn and place them in two different trample steams. This step is really not too bad, it's just that the plutonium mod that I was using had a lot of glitches concerning it. And finally the last step is the pylon step, same as the Richthof inside. And yeah, these were the two easter eggs of Die Rise. Out of every single easter egg that I have completed up until now, I have never had this many technical problems with two of them. I gotta say, it's pretty jarring trying to complete either side of the easter egg on this map, knowing that I may have to restart multiple times because the game doesn't give a fuck about how I feel and could crush my heart and soul on a whim. But even when the easter eggs work perfectly fine, there's nothing notably interesting about them. And see, the thing is, I can't really be too harsh about this map because this map came before, like, the fucking ridiculous easter eggs in Black Ops 3 and beyond. But even the Black Ops 1 easter eggs were significantly more interesting than this. But anyway, that was Die Rise. This map had a lot on its shoulders when it came out. It was supposed to remedy the disastrous start of Black Ops 2, which was Transit. And unfortunately, the map didn't deliver well enough to keep player interest. Every single Call of Duty Zombies map that released up until this point tried to innovate in a way that refines the game mode. But Mob of the Dead was a different beast. This map changed the entire dynamic of how zombies worked. The quest style map design that defined Black Ops 3 
was founded in Mob of the Dead. As the origin of a format that could potentially be used later on in the series, the developers went all out with Mob of the Dead, going as far as to travel to the actual Alcatraz prison to study the area and mold it into an actual zombies map. It's always a treat when Call of Duty integrates real life historic places and events into their games. Most of the time, however, it's integrated within politics and military. For example, you have the Black Ops 1 map 5, where it's set in the Pentagon, and the characters that you play as on 5 are major figureheads from the Cold War like John F. Kennedy and Fidel Castro. But Mob takes an entirely different approach to this. Mob is based on a prison and is also inspired by a real life event. The event I'm referring to is a prison escape that happened in the 1960s, where four inmates used rubber from raincoats to make an inflatable raft to escape. Three of these inmates managed to escape and the fourth one was left out. Mob's story is a zombie's take on this event, where four inmates devise a plan to make a plane. The four in question are Sal DeLuca, Vin O'Leary, Billy Handsome, and finally Al Arlington. These four were actually together before they went to prison, where Sal was the leader of all three of them. Since they knew each other before going into prison, they decided all four of them to devise a plan to escape. Al gave the other three the idea of creating a plane so they can escape off the roof of the island. The other three agreed to this idea and decided to go through it. The first part of it was to escape their cells. Al Arlington lures the guard into his cell to kill him and get his keys. He then proceeds to open up the cells for the other three inmates so that they can start their plan. But the plan never goes through because they get surrounded by zombies zombies and killed. The reason I went out of my way to explain the story of this map, it's because the cornerstone feature of Mob of the Dead is storyline. Unlike all of the maps before Mob of the Dead that explain their story through vague means like radios, Mob takes a more direct and cinematic approach in explaining its story. The more that you progress through the gameplay, the more that you progress through the story. So I'm gonna do something similar and try to explain both at the same time. Once you begin a match, all players spawn on afterlife mode. In afterlife mode, you're able to jump significantly higher and shock things. Things you're able to electrify include these panels right here. You could also shock zombies to teleport them away from your location, and you can also shock certain items around the map. But most of the time you're using afterlife to shock the afterlife panels, because the power switch mechanic has been completely removed in favor of these panels. You have a limited amount of time to be in afterlife mode, and if that time runs out, you die. So you have to revive yourself before that timer runs out. The way you get into afterlife is you can go to the many red boxes around the map and shock yourself. You could also get into afterlife mode if you get downed by the zombies, but getting into afterlife that way has a lot more disadvantages than using the red boxes. You can use any of your afterlives at any round, and you will get a new afterlife every single round. If you were to be playing co-op, then every single player has one afterlife that you can use. And in solo, you have a limit of three afterlifes. Because of this limit, you have to use afterlife sparingly, mainly because you need it to shock all of the afterlife panels. Once the characters are revived with afterlife, they mention that they have to build the plane to escape. So from the beginning, a main goal is established for all the characters, and that is to build Al's plane. The game shows you where the plane parts are in this poster right here in Spawn, as well as showing you the checklist of things that you have to do in order to fly out of the map. Building the plane on this map is actually a very simple process. Most of it is just shocking panels with afterlife and doing puzzles here and there. Shock the generator to get the key. Go to the showers, turn on the laundry to get the uniforms. Go to the spiraling staircase, shock these three numbers with afterlifes and get your rigging. Go to the docks and shock the cage door to get the tank. Go to the infirmary and using the warden's key, open up the cabinet to get the control valve. The most complicated one to get is the ventilator. The ventilators are located in the warden's office, but to get access to them, you have to shut down these three generators in the citadel tunnels. You do that by simply shocking them with afterlife. And if that's the most complicated one to get, then this process isn't that complicated. It can take a very good chunk of time, however. The fastest that I managed to build the plane was around 12 minutes. And I did that by completely ignoring any form of meaningful progression like getting weapons and getting perks. And hey, if you choose this method of getting the plane for some reason, you can get it by round 4 or 5 if you wish. But I would guess that most people take their time gathering things before going to the plane. But anyway, once you finish building the plane, you can finally leave Alcatraz Island. Congratulations, you and the boys can get ready for takeoff, and you have finally realized your dream of living happily ever after. But unfortunately for you, the weather doesn't care about your feelings and it tells you to go fuck yourself, as it proceeds to literally
literally smite you off the fucking air. You're given a moment to look around the area and you find that there is a pack a punch machine and nothing else. And the characters realize that they're stuck here forever, they can't do anything about it, and no one is going to help them. In a desperate attempt to end their misery, they electrify themselves via the electric chair. <laughs> But all that does is send you back to spawn and restarts the cycle. But this time the map is fully opened, you have all of your weapons and your perks and the round still stays the same. One cool detail that I noticed is that the game tries to subtly tell you about the situation you're in. One example of this is that when they electrify themselves with the electric chair and go back to the spawn room, they act as if nothing just happened, like it was a fever dream. Another instance of this is that every single time you ride the plane, the characters say the exact same quote every single time. Since the characters are stuck in a cycle, it would only make sense that every single time they ride the plane, they feel like it's their first time riding it, even though it's not. It's quite the attention of detail that has never been given before, really making it one of the more unique experiences in the entire franchise. But that's not all what Mob of the Dead is known for. Mob added a few new additions to zombies, one of which is Electric Cherry. Electric Cherry is a new perk that allows you to stun any zombie around you when you reload. This perk is very useful while camping because it could save you in situations where you need a little bit more time to reload your weapon, but it mainly shines on close quarter situations. And because of how close quarters Mob of the Dead can be, this perk feels tailor made for the map. Another new addition is Brutus. Brutus is basically a stronger and more durable version of a zombie that also has the ability to lock things down. Brutus can lock down the perk machines, the mystery box, as well as buildables. And when they're locked, you have to spend 2000 points if you want to wish to use them again. However, Brutus's health isn't so ridiculous that this is much of an issue. If you take care of him quickly, he won't bother you as much. When I came back to play this map again, I was genuinely surprised by how fast I was killing Brutus. And with the rewards that you get for killing him, which is a free drop and 1000 points, he genuinely makes early rounds significantly better. Then there's a new piece of equipment, the Hell's Retriever. The Retriever is a tomahawk with boomerang-like properties. You you can throw it at a certain direction and it will automatically track to any zombie within its range. The amount of targets that it can hit at once will depend on how much you hold it before throwing it. If you were to throw it instantaneously, it will only hit a couple of zombies, but if you were to hold it, it can kill a maximum of 6 zombies. But it does not do infinite damage as it's only a one shot kill up until round 19. Once the targets are hit, the retriever will be, well, retrieved back to you. And in order to use the retriever again, you have to wait for a 5 second cooldown. The retriever also has the ability to retrieve drops that you throw it at. Say there's a double points or a max ammo in the distance, you can throw a retriever at this power up and it will come back to you. The retriever can also be upgraded into the Hell's Redeemer. The upgrade makes it so that the damage is now infinite, which makes it a very useful tool to have, especially in high rounds because it's the only weapon on the map that has infinite damage besides the traps. Granted, it being infinite damage doesn't necessarily mean that it's overpowered. You can only kill one horde per minute. That is extremely slow comparative to using normal weapons where you can clear out an entire horde in a couple of seconds. But even if you were to be using it passively, it's still a pretty useful tool to have. And it's also pretty easy to get. You fill up three dog heads to get the retriever, then you go to the bridge and get a dozen kills, then you go to this lava pit and throw your retriever, and that's it, that's how you get the redeemer. You get so much for such a simple process. And finally, last but not least, is the wonder weapon, the Blundergat. The Blundergat is basically a single barrel shotgun with extremely high damage. You can pack a punch it normally and it will turn into a sweeper, which is basically a super powerful double barrel shotgun. Or you can turn it into the acid gat, which turns it into a super powerful explosive weapon with the properties of the crossbow from Black Ops 1. And like the Black Ops 1 crossbow, when you pack a punch the acid gad and turn it into the vitrolic withering, it becomes a monkey bomb shooter. The way that you get the blunder gad is one of two different ways. You can either get it from the box, or you can do an easter egg where you find 5 skulls with the hell's retriever. But if you want to upgrade your blunder gad into an acid gad, you have to make the acid gad kit, which is by collecting 3 parts and putting them in a workbench. The blunder gad is actually the first map exclusive weapon to have this property, where you have two different 
different ways of getting the weapon. And for a very long time, Mob of the Dead was the only map in Zombies where you had this property. That was until the release of Black Ops 4 where it was present in most of its maps, which is surprising because this feature is genuinely great. If you happen to not know or not remember or too lazy to acquire the Wonder Weapon via a quest, you can simply rely on your luck and hit the box until you get it. In comparison, most other maps would force you to rely on your luck to get the Wonder Weapon out of the box. And in other maps, it forces you to have the knowledge of acquiring the Wonder Weapon via a quest. But here, the game gives you the freedom to choose between which one you want to do. And that's why I find it to be a fantastic feature. Now, after listening for about 10 minutes of me praising this map, you may conclude that I really like Mob of the Dead. And I do like Mob, but I don't hold it to such a high regard like a lot of people do. One issue with this map that I've always had is how repetitive it can be. Before I explain why I believe that, let me first establish what I believe to be the three main factors for avoiding repetitiveness. The first one is how you progress through the gameplay. You have to make sure that a map isn't too linear, doesn't take too long, and the map also shouldn't force you to repeat certain actions or punish you unfairly because of something that is beyond your control. The second one is variety within your kit. A map should always give you many options for guns, for perks, for strategies like training or camping that you can use. And finally, there's difficulty. Out of the three, this one is by far the most subjective one. The way people perceive difficulty is quite different from one another. Some people like the easygoing maps like Kino and Ascension where they can relax and have a good time without worrying too much about what they're doing. Other people like maps that are so difficult that they border on the line of ridiculous. One example of which is World of War Varakt with all of its super sprinters. Super sprinters that run just as fast as you do in a game that has terrible zombies AI and a map that is very narrow. Some people call that utterly unfair, other people see the chaotic nature of this map and enjoy it for what it is. But I would say that most people enjoy a happy medium between these two things. Maps that aren't so easy that you can play them on autopilot and maps that aren't so difficult that one mistake could crush your entire game. So let's see how Mob falls into each of these three factors. Mob does the best at factor number one, which is gameplay progression. In Mob of the Dead, you have three main goals, to get the Blundergat or Acid get upgraded to get the Hell's Redeemer and to get Pack-a-Punch. To pursue any of these goals, you are required to build the plane. Since the plane is pretty much required for all of these, it becomes your main priority in the beginning of every single match. What this results to is that every few rounds of every single match of Mob of the Dead basically play the exact same. Now, I'm not saying that there's absolutely zero choices that you're provided, but the choices that you are provided aren't really radical changes in gameplay. Now, Mob of the Dead isn't really the only modern zombies map with this type of progression. Gorod Krovi is another example where going to the Pack-a-Punch area of the map is a mandatory thing that you have to do first. Because not only is Pack-a-Punch there, but so is the Dragon Strike as well as the Dragon Egg. But there's one thing that Mob has that Garad Krovi doesn't, and that would be the fuel cans. So, for the first time flying the plane, you obviously need the five parts to build it. What happens if you want to fly the plane again? Instead of getting the five plane parts again, you have to get five fuel cans. Each one of them is positioned somewhere close to the original plane parts. And unlike the original plane parts, you don't have to do any puzzle or anything like that. They're just there. The problem with this is obvious you have to mindlessly run around the entire map picking them up one by one. And in co-op, the problem is worsened by the fact that each player can only hold one fuel can at a time. And mind you, this is the first map in Zombies where there is a shared inventory, plus each player can hold multiple parts at once. But that rule doesn't apply to the plane parts or the fuel cans. And it's not even the worst thing about this. When you come back to spawn from the bridge, you actually can't find any of the fuel cans. The reason that's the case is because you have to end the current round in order for these fuel cans to spawn. What that essentially means is that you no longer have access to Pack-a-Punch for the rest of the entire round. This is arguably one of the worst aspects of any Pack-a-Punch ever. Now, to be fair to the developers, 
This choice was probably intentional because of the story and the easter egg, as you need to go to the bridge a couple of times to do the easter egg, of course. So this was a necessary sacrifice to do something greater. And also, to be fair, this is Black Ops 2 we're talking about. Most of the time, you're using Pack-a-Punch once or twice a game, so it isn't as much of a problem as it would be in Black Ops 4, for example, where Pack-a-Punching multiple times for multiple weapons is essential. It was clearly an intentional design choice by the developers for it to be this way. But the next factor isn't really one that I can let slide that easily. Let's go into the second factor, which is variety within your kit. It's definitely not the box weapons and the exclusives that you you have on this map. In fact, a couple of them are some of my favorite weapons in this game, one of which is the Uzi. It's really unfortunate that this is the only map in the game that has this. And the other weapons that this map has to offer are also pretty fun to use. You have things like the AK, the Death Machine, and the M1927 Thompson. But let's take a closer look at the two wonder weapons that we have the Sweeper and the Vitrolic Withering. So what I would guess was the design philosophy with these two weapons was that the Sweeper was supposed to be the offensive choice and the Vitrolic Withering was supposed to be the defensive choice, and it was up to the player to pick which one he prefers over the other. And that in itself is a fantastic idea, but there was a little bit of a problem here. Out of these two wonder weapons, it was so clear which was the better choice out of the two. The Sweeper is a one-shot kill to the head up until round 40, and the Vitrolic Withering starts making crawlers within the 20s. But the damage in the Vitrolic Withering is pretty much irrelevant because the point of the weapon is to distract zombies via the distraction effect. The Sweeper, on the other hand, is way too weak to be a viable option against the Vitrolic Withering. Don't get me wrong, it's still a pretty useful weapon within the 20s, but a lot of weapons weapons are useful within the 20s. It doesn't make it that much of a favorable option against a weapon that can defend you in any situation. I wish the sweeper had something along the lines of a dragon's breath attachment along with it, and the damage output from the fire produced by this dragon's breath would be percentage based. So basically what I'm talking about is that it would kind of work similarly to Blast Furnace in Black Ops 3. The way I think it would work best is if it were to take 50% of the maximum zombie's health within like 2 to 3 seconds, which basically turns this into a two-shot kill at any round. I promise you, design the sweeper this way and way more people would be using it for high rounds. But that's really only for the wonder weapon. I haven't even started talking about the worst part of this factor yet, which is the perks. Mob of the Dead has only 5 perks. Juggernaug, Double Tap, Speed Cola, Electric Cherry, and Deadshot. This design choice never made sense to me. In Mob of the Dead, you can't get all five perks. You can only choose four out of the five. And let's analyze all of the five right now. Juggernaug increases your health by 150%. Double Tap increases your damage by 100%. Speed Cola reduces your reload time by 50%. Electric Cherry stuns any zombie around you when you reload. And Deadshot reduces your hipfire spread by 35%. No human being requires much intelligence to know which of the five is the worst. This results in you running the exact same four perks every single game, which fucking sucks. I honestly don't understand why the rest of the perks aren't there, except for Quick Revive because of Afterlife, but I genuinely don't understand why the rest of the perks are missing. Stamina would have been so helpful in a map like this where you have to run around a lot, and perks like Mule Kick and PhD give you a lot more freedom in choosing your kit. It's really a shame because these perks would have helped the map so much more. But out of every factor, I think Mob does the worst at difficulty. The way I would lay out difficulty is like this. There's the difficulty of the early game, which is setting up and there's the difficulty of the late game, which is the high rounds. It's important to differentiate between the two because some maps start off easy, then get progressively harder, like for example Moon, and some maps are hard in the beginning, but it gets progressively easier, like for example Zetsubo no Shima. But in both of these cases, it's important to not go to the full extreme. As I mentioned before, a map shouldn't be so difficult that one mistake could crush your game, or is so easy that you can play it on autopilot. So how does Mob do in this factor? Well, let's start off from the beginning, which in this case is building the plane. As I mentioned before, building the plane takes quite a while. And the reason that's the case is that Mob is a very expensive map. Some of the doors on this map are 2000 points on solo. Another thing worth noting is that Juggernaug is on the other side of the map. Since Jug is this far away and the doors are very expensive, you need to maximize your point gain in order to survive. There's also the map space Mob is one of the more narrow maps in the series. There's barely any open space in this map, so positioning yourself carefully is also very important. However, not everything is against you. 
The game gives you a lot of leeway with Afterlife. Since Afterlife acts as a source of power and self-revive, if you happen to die, it isn't too bad. Because even if you happen to go down, you can still power up the map. But at the same time, you can't waste all of your afterlives on downs, so it's important to conserve them as much as you possibly can. With all of these things in mind, I would consider Mob's early game to be moderately difficult, which is fantastic. So what happens after you get fully set up and you're ready for your high rounds? What are the high rounds like? After you go to the bridge, there is almost no need to use afterlife ever again. But despite that, it still replenishes every single round. That means that you basically have unlimited self-revives for free. Mere words cannot describe how broken this is. The thing also about Afterlife is that it's probably the best self-revive we've ever gotten in the series. While you're in Afterlife, you can shock zombies away from your path to make it easier for you to escape. And on top of this ridiculously broken mechanic, you have so many defensive tools at your disposal. You have the shield to protect your back, you have electric cherry to stun the zombies around you when you get cornered, and you have the Vitrolic Withering, a literal monkey bomb shooter. But the thing about Mob of the Dead is that everything overpowered about it is overpowered defensively. There isn't anything in particular that kills zombies very quickly on this map. The only weapons on this map that have infinite damage is the Hell's Redeemer and the traps, both of which kill zombies at a relatively slow rate. The problem with Mob of the Dead's difficulty is not that it's easy. It's the way that it's easy. You're all defense and no offense. You're like an indestructible shield without a weapon. I wish Mob of the Dead was part of the Chronicles pack in Black Ops 3. With the many tools Black Ops 3 gives you for high rounds like Double Pack a Punch, Gobble Gum, and the Wonder Fizz Machine, the high rounds on Mob of the Dead would have been improved significantly. But regardless, this is why I find this map to be incredibly repetitive. Let's get on to the Easter egg now. The Mob of the Dead Easter egg is quite short and simple. Your objective is to break the cycle and escape purgatory. It's a pretty neat idea, so let's see how the game handles this. First, you have to acquire the Hell's Retriever and the Blundergat via the Blundergat Easter egg. Next, you have to fly the plane and come back to the prison. Next, you have to throw a Retriever at this poster and then go into afterlife and shock this spoon. Then you have to go to the cafeteria and throw the Retriever at this table to get the spoon. Then take the spoon, put it in a bathtub in the infirmary, and then you have to fly the plane two more times. Then you go to the spiraling staircase in afterlife and input a bunch of number codes. This will spawn five audio recordings around the map that you have to listen to fully. Then you have to fly the plane again, but this time you're in afterlife. Once you arrive at the bridge, your team will be split into two. Everyone that is playing Sal, Billy, and Finn will be in one team. The second team will be Weasel and the zombies as his allies. In order to finish the easter egg, one of the teams has to kill the other. If Team Weasel succeeds, then the cycle is broken. But if Team Weasel fails, the cycle continues. So let me first go over what's good with this easter egg. First of all, it's simple and coherent. It's one of the very few easter eggs I can think of where you can solve this without a guide. The way that the easter egg tells the story is also great. It does portray very well how the characters are stuck in this purgatory. And the audio logs at the end of the easter egg are genuinely an interesting listen. It turns out that in the real world, a plane was never made. What instead happened was that Al Arlington was led to the roof and was killed by the other three inmates. See, what happened was that Al somehow convinced the rest of the three to create a plane to escape. In the conceiving of this plan, a lot of infighting happened between the group which led to a lot of frustration, and that was what led to Elle's death. This revelation then leads to the final step of the easter egg, where your team has to fight each other. It's a sad yet fitting ending for these four characters. But this sad moment is completely undermined by the fact that you're fighting your friends. <laughs> Does he die? Oblah. Oblah ya! Which that leads us to the two main problems with this easter egg. The first one is that it's not accessible. Now granted, the story wouldn't really make any sense if you're able to do this easter egg solo, but you still can do this easter egg solo. But there was a lot of ideas they could have done to fix this. They could have taken the bots from the multiplayer and coded them into this map. Then there's the easter egg itself. The bulk of the entire easter egg is going to pack a punch 
four times. Yes, it's supposed to signify that these characters are in a cycle, but there are so many more interesting ways to go about this. I don't think that the developers really wanted this easter egg to be this way. Something that many of you don't know is that MOB was actually supposed to be much bigger than it is, but the map was made the way that it is due to hardware restrictions. They probably planned something much more interesting gameplay-wise for the easter egg. But regardless, this is what we got, and unfortunately, it's way too lacking for gameplay. Here's a couple of ideas that I have for this. One idea I've always had about Mob of the Dead is the idea of having it so that there are multiple ways to escape the prison, not just the plane. For example, in the docks, you can make it so that you can make a boat to escape from. You can also make it so that in the warden's office, you can make a distress call to a nearby police station. And you can make it so that all of these three paths lead to different areas of the map. In my personal opinion, if you made it so that there's multiple ways for the characters to escape, but yet not a single one of them works, it would give a greater feeling of hopelessness, and in my opinion would add more to this easter egg not only in just gameplay but also in the story too. But who knows, they probably had an idea like this but they could again due to hardware restrictions. But all in all, that was Mob of the Dead. Mob was the catalyst that changed zombies forever. And for that, it holds a special place in the hearts of many people. The map was very unique in how it turned zombies into a movie-like experience. And while that was a great change of pace for the game mode, it did result in its repetitive nature. Jimmy Zielinski's last tribute to this game mode. Buried. This was probably his biggest achievement in this game mode in my opinion. My reason isn't specifically that it's one of his better maps in the series, but that it's quite possibly the biggest anomaly in the entire game mode. Normally when a successful map comes out that has a very unique design, future maps try to emulate its design. A good example of this would be Shadows of Evil. Shadows of Evil is a great map in its own right, but it's very closely designed to Mob of the Dead. A lot of the design choices in this map are very similar to Mob. For example, you have Beast Mode, which is a very similar concept to Afterlife. You also have the four gateworms and the summoning key, a concept similar to the five plane parts in Mob of the Dead. Sure, the map plays differently with its wonder weapons and its easter egg, but you could say that both of them are similar to cousins in the same family. Buried in comparison feels like a friend from a different country. So what is it that makes Buried so different than the rest? Well, it's within its design. Playing Buried is like playing in a giant armory. Everything that you could possibly need is close by and easily accessible. Whether it's perks, or guns, or buildables, it doesn't matter. You have access to all of it. And you can even control the map to a certain degree. This is Arthur, also known as Leroy by the community. You'll first see him in this jail cell where you have to get this key and open the cage for him. At first, he will be frightened by your mere presence like a baby. And like a baby, you have to calm him down by giving him a pacifier, which in this case is a giant bottle of booze. Giving him the bottle of booze will result in him turning around and slamming the debris behind him. When you do that, he is officially your companion and he will wander around the map. There are two types of doors on this map. There are doors that you can buy with points and there are doors that you can only open using Leroy. In order to open these doors with Leroy, you have to give him booze and he will slam into these doors. And the cool thing about this is that instead of spending points to open doors, you gain points with opening doors. But booze isn't the only thing that you can give Leroy. You can also give him candy. The result of giving Leroy candy can differ quite heavily depending on where you are and what you're close by. The amount of things that could happen from giving him candy is way too many for me to list all of them. So let me name the most important ones. Giving him candy by a mystery box will lock that mystery box down permanently, making it impossible to get a teddy bear and the box to move. Giving him candy beside a drop will make it so that he will switch the drop for another one. Giving him candy by a crawler will make it so that he will hold the crawler indefinitely so that it doesn't despawn. And finally, you can give him candy to build buildables for you. Another form of control that you have over the map, other than the abuse of a traumatized, mentally ill tall man, is wall weapons. 
Normally in a Call of Duty Zombies map, the wall weapons are always set in the exact same locations. In this map, however, every single wall weapon location becomes vacant, and you get to choose what is the wall weapon in each of these locations. Some wall weapons like the M16 and the B23R are set in stone in the exact same location, but the other stronger wall weapons are the ones that you have control over, like the AN-94, the PDW, and the SVU. Another form of control that you have over is the buildables. In the previous two Victus maps, each buildable was limited to only one certain location. For example, the zombie shield in transit can only be built on the diner, and the jet gun can only be built in town. Barry changed this and made it so that you can put any buildable in any buildable table. Mob of the Dead introduced Introduced this feature, but I thought it was more important to talk about it here on this map because it matters so much more. Every single part for all of the buildables except the Nafkar table are all in one place and that's the general store. And all of the four buildable tables are very close to each other, which made these buildables a lot more convenient to craft. And all of the four buildables are great. The trample steam works the same way as it does on Diarise, although it is a bit less useful because of the circumstances that you're in. Buried is a lot more condensed in comparison to Diarise, which is much larger and using the trample seam on there will make you travel farther distances than in Buried. But it's definitely not useless, it's still pretty useful. You can still use it as a shortcut to go from one place to another faster. Like for example, you can go from Jug to the courthouse. The second buildable you're provided is the Head Chopper. As the name would entail, any zombie that gets close to it will get his head chopped off. It can do a considerable amount of damage, but it's so slow that it's more so used as a support item than a killing machine. Then there's the turbine, which suffers a very similar case to the trample steam where it's not nearly as useful as the map that it used to be in. As getting to the power switch from spawn requires only one door. Its only main purpose is to be a power source to the subservice resonator. The subservice resonator is the only buildable on this map that requires the turbine. Once this buildable is powered up by the turbine, it will start to periodically shoot unidirectional shockwaves. These shockwaves have an insane range and they do infinite damage, making it one of the strongest buildables of all time. All of these things that you can control on Buried gives you a lot of variety when constructing strategies. For example, one of the most famous camping spots on this map, the Juggernaut location, can be optimized so well to your liking. You can leave the box in its starting location or you can move it to the upper floor, and then you can make Leroy lock it down giving you unlimited access to the box. And by this camping location, there are two vacant wall weapon areas. You can put two of any of your favorite wall weapons there, and in the second floor of this area, you have a buildable table where you can put whatever buildable you want. But even with all of that, there's one additional thing that makes this much better and that is the gun variety on this map. As I mentioned before, you have weapons like the AN-94, the PDW, and the SVU at your disposal, which are very powerful weapons. You also have the LSAT on the wall on spawn. The box weapons haven't changed much from Die Rise and Transit, but there are two new wonder weapons on this map. First off is the Paralyzer. The Paralyzer is another infinite ammo wonder weapon, similar to the jet gun. The Paralyzer shoots beams that slow down zombies to a halt which eventually kills them. Similar to the jet gun, it has an overheating mechanic, but this time it doesn't break when it overheats. But the Paralyzer's main ability is the ability to fly. This is such a useful ability on this map with the amount of freedom that it gives you. You can fly over zombies, you can fly over debris, you can go to upper floors, and you can even use it on your teammates to make them fly. It's definitely more of a mobility tool than an offensive tool. Fortunately, it's not even the only wonder weapon on this map. There was a second wonder weapon that was added, which was the Raygun Mark II. The Raygun Mark II is a 3 round burst SMG equivalent to the normal Raygun. And what a behemoth of a weapon it is. When you pack a punch the Mark II, it does 4600 damage per single shot. It is almost as strong as the sweeper with double tap that does 5000 damage. But what makes it ridiculous is that each headshot does 100,000 damage. Not only is it so ridiculously strong, but it's one of the most fun weapons to use in the entire game. One cool thing about the Mark II is that it's not actually exclusive to Buried. When this map came out, the Mark II came with it, 
but it was retroactively added back to every single zombies map previous in the game. It served as a really cool update for these previous maps. Another thing that Buried added was an exclusive perma perk to this map and that is PhD. This is the only map exclusive perma perk in the entire game. It was not added to Die Rise or Transit, which is honestly quite sad. I wish this was retroactively added to these two other maps similar to the Regum Mark II. So how this perma perk works is that it still gives you the explosive immunity as well as the explosive flop, but it does not give you the fall damage immunity. The way you get this perma perk is by repeatedly getting fall damage without dying. And the way that you lose this perma perk is also by fall damage, which for a map like this, it's a very easy requirement to fulfill. Most of the time you're in the lower floors where you don't have to deal with any fall damage in the first place. And if you happen to be in a situation where fall damage could be a possibility, you can simply dolphin dive to avoid it completely. But there's more to perks than just PhD. A new perk that was added, which was Vulture's Aid. This perk has three abilities in total. The first ability is being able to see important items marked in front of you through walls. Things like the mystery box, wall weapons, perks, and the pack punch machine. The second thing that Vulture's Aid can do is make it so that zombies can drop extra points and bullets. The amount of points that you are given is very negligible. It's like 15 or 20 points per drop, but it's the ammo where it makes a difference. It isn't that useful when you're using weapons like assault rifles and LMGs with a lot of ammo, but if you're using weapons with very little ammo counts, like sniper rifles and explosives, this can be a very useful ability. The final ability is easily the most powerful of the three, and that is the Green Cloud of Gas. When you buy this perk, zombies will occasionally have green gas emitting from their body. Killing the specified zombie will make it so that this green gas is released from them. And when you go to it and stand on top of it, all zombies will ignore you. This is such a great perk when you're camping. It's basically a free monkey bomb for every single horde of zombies. So anytime you're ever overwhelmed by zombies, you can simply step into this green gas and they will ignore you. It's quite surprising to me how this perk never came back when a lot of people love it. A lot of people speculate that the reason why it never came back because of how overpowered it was. I don't really find that to be the case because newer perks are significantly more overpowered. You have Widow's Wine you have Winter's Wail, you have Dying Wish, and then there's the majority of perks from Cold War, all of which are significantly stronger than Vulture Aid. We will probably never know why the perk never returned. But regardless, the perk is still pretty cool. The last addition that I want to talk about to Buried is the Time Bomb. The Time Bomb marks a safe point in your gameplay. This safe point will record the round that you're currently in, the weapons that you currently have, the perks that you currently have, as well as the points that you currently have. And using the time bomb at any point in the future will revert you back to the safe point. The point of the time bomb was clearly supposed to be a reset button when things go south. But the thing is, nobody uses it that way. A lot of people would use the time bomb to troll people on public matches and to troll their friends. But the main use of the time bomb came from the variety of glitches that it had. One of the glitches that I am aware of, and it's the only one that I ever use with the time bomb, is the double free perks. But before I explain it, I need to first explain the witch's mansion, so let's do that first. This mansion is on the other side of the map, and entering it will despawn any zombie. Once you enter the mansion, you have to fight an onslaught of witches. These witches have the ability to steal your points, so you need to kill them quickly before they steal all of your points. Thankfully, they have a very low amount of health and they can be killed easily. Once you kill the last of the witch's onslaught, you get a free perk. And here's where the glitch that I mentioned earlier comes in. So in order to do this glitch, you have to kill all of the witches except for the last one. Then you have to throw a time bomb before killing the last witch. Once you do that, you can now kill the last witch and the free perk will spawn. But don't take it, use the time bomb first. This will make it so that the free perk is still there, but the last witch will also respawn. When you kill her, you will get another free perk. And along with this glitch, there's also the dartboard easter egg, where you can shoot this dartboard with a ballistic knife and you can go to the mansion and tip this witch to get another free perk. So if you were to do this easter egg in tandem with the glitch I mentioned earlier, you can get three free perks. And if you had four perks beforehand, you can get every single perk in the map, which is honestly quite ridiculous. 
With all of these features at your disposal, the map basically turns into sandbox mode. And while I sometimes enjoy the fact that I can control a lot of aspects about the gameplay and being able to get every single perk in one round, it could sometimes feel a little bit too easy. And when adding the bank on top of this, Buried literally breaks every single rule of progression. The bank on Buried allows you to get every single perk on the map as well as every single wonder weapon on the map pack-a-punched as well as another third gun that is pack-a-punched on round one. There isn't a single other feature that allows for this much. It's akin to playing Minecraft and starting a world on creative mode where you give yourself stacks of every material that you need and then you turn it into survival mode and start the world that way. Now you may be thinking why would the bank be a problem on this map and not the previous maps Diarise and Transit? Well, I'll tell you my explanation as to why. On transit, the bank is somewhat required to enjoy the map because otherwise the map is too insufferable to play. And in the case of Diarise, there's such little to spend points on on the map that the bank almost makes no difference. Buried in comparison requires you to spend numerous thousand points to get everything. The ballistic knife is needed from the box to get the dartboard easter egg. The time bomb is also needed if you want to do the glitch I mentioned earlier. And the two wonder weapons of the map are in the box. The game offers one one booze and one candy every single round. So if you want to use multiple of either of them in one singular round, you have to pay a thousand points every single time. And if you want to get every single perk on the map, you are required to buy four perks. So you can see how the bank affects Buried more negatively than the other two maps. The traditional sense of progression of zombies doesn't even exist on Buried, even if you don't consider the bank. The map design is so focused on giving you variety that it doesn't care if it breaks the rules of zombies. And if I'm being honest, this concept can be appealing at times. As I mentioned before, with the amount of variety that you have, the amount of strategies that you can conceive are basically endless. Buried is never the map to go to when you're looking for a challenge. You go to Buried when you either want to relax and use whatever you want, or you want to fuck around with your friends. And for that, I give it a lot of credit. But that was the core gameplay side of things. What about the map's two easter eggs? Out of the maps that we've talked about so far, the two easter eggs in here are easily the best. Particularly the Richthofen side, which is my personal favorite easter egg in this game. Finally, I get to do an easter egg that doesn't have any glitches and actually has fun steps. The only thing that I genuinely hate about these two easter eggs is that, again, they require four players. But in a similar case to Mob, the map requiring four players has its merits. These two easter eggs are the ultimate test of player coordination. When every single player knows exactly what they're doing, the easter eggs run smoothly. However, if you happen to be in a similar case like myself, where I got three other teammates where all four of us have never done this easter egg, it can be quite tough. But the easter egg was never frustrating or tedious despite how fucking clueless we were, because the complexity of the steps aren't the difficult part. It's the teamwork that is difficult. You have to map out exactly what everyone is supposed to do within a certain step, which is a lot tougher than you would think. With a lot of these steps, one mistake can ruin the entire step and you have to reset. But the thing that I like about Buried is the way that it's so generous with the resets. Almost every single step in the easter egg, if failed, can be reset immediately. The only exception to this are steps that require the time bomb. If you fail any of them, you have to get a max ammo first before resetting. Thankfully, there's there's only one time bomb step in each of these easter eggs, so it's not really that much of a problem. But anyway, let's get into the actual steps of both of these easter eggs. Starting it off with the Richthofen side. The first step of this easter egg requires you to get four parts around the map and put them in this guillotine. Then you have to get the paralyzer out of the box and charge four orbs around the map by shooting them with the paralyzer. Once you're done with that, a lamp will spawn in the main area. You have to throw a grenade at it in order for it to fall down and pick it up. Once you get this lamp, you have to fill it up with souls by killing the witches. And with that done, you've already done half of the easter egg. The first half of this easter egg is surprisingly very simple and easy to follow. It's the next steps that are very complex. You have to go to this area right here and solve this puzzle. These codes signify three signs that you have to knife using Galva Knuckles or a Bowie knife. You have to decipher the three codes to know which of the three signs the game requires you to knife. And by decipher the codes, I mean look it up online. Steps like this that require you to look up guides
websites online are often something that I dislike. It doesn't feel intuitive or immersive to look up a third party website just to finish an easter egg. Fortunately, this is the only step in the easter egg that requires you to do this, but it's still something that I wanted to point out. Once you've knifed the three signs, a wisp will spawn that you have to follow around. You have to keep following it until it reaches the guillotine. Once it reaches the guillotine, you have to fill it up with a couple of zombie souls and you finish this step. And then we get into one of my favorite steps in this easter egg. The time bomb step. You have to throw the time bomb at the guillotine and use it to travel to the future. While you're in the future, you're on round infinity where the zombies don't die. And what you're tasked with is to find your future selves and try to find a certain switch. This is the first step of the easter egg where it really requires the team coordination because the amount of time you're given is way too little to search every single body. So in order to do this step efficiently, every player has to go to a certain location and search up there. Once the players find the switch, they can now go back to the present and put the switch in the guillotine. And finally, you have to do the switch step in the maze. Four switches can be found in the maze. Each of these switches have completely different colors. You need to turn on these switches in a specific order. To figure out this order, you have to use trial and error. This is also one of the other steps where it requires the utmost communication with your team in order to complete. You are given as many tries as you wish, but in order to reset, you have to leave the maze and come back again. But if you manage to turn all of the switches in the correct order, you finally finish this step. There is one more final step, but I'm gonna talk about it after I finish the Maxis side as the last step of both sides are the same. The Maxis side starts in a similar fashion to the Richthofen side. Collect four parts and put them by the snooze. Use the subsurface resonator to destroy the four orbs around the map. Collect souls by giving Leroy candy and make him fight the zombies. Put the lamp back in this location where you have to get the three codes for the signs. Look them up online and now you can start the wisp step. This is one of the most difficult steps in the egg. You have to spawn the wisp and lead it to the noose. And while you're doing that, you have to also charge it with zombie souls. And you don't charge it up by killing the zombies. You have to let the wisp pass through the zombies. If you don't charge it with enough zombie souls, the wisp will disappear and now you have to restart the step. In order to do this step efficiently, you need to have three of your teammates train zombies in three different areas. And each of your teammates have to path the zombies in a a certain way so that the wisp passes through them. This step gets especially difficult in late rounds where you have to let your teammates train in these very small areas and you also have to train them in a way where the wisps pass through the zombies. And to top it all off, you have to do the step not once, but twice. Messing up the step can be quite infuriating as you need the time bomb to do it and if you mess up with the time bomb, you have to get another one via max ammo. But once you get the hang of it, this step isn't really too bad. And finally, we have the bell step. There are three locations around the map that have three bells. The three locations are the barn, the courthouse, and the second floor of the candy shop. The three bells in these locations are numbered from one to three. You need three of your teammates to be positioned in each of these three places, and one person has to go to the witch's mansion. Inside there, there will be a lever with nine lights. Each column of light bulbs signify one of the three locations with the bells. Once the person in the witch's mansion turns on this lever, there's going to be one of the nine lights turned on, which will signify to one of the bells in one of the three locations. Once the light is turned on, you have to click the bell that corresponds to this light. If done correctly, that light will turn from yellow to green, and then another light will go yellow. In order to finish this step, all nine lights have to be green. Out of every puzzle in both sides of the easter eggs, this one is by far the easiest. It's simply a matter of the three players knowing the order of their bells and the person in the witch's mansion knowing the correct callouts. And even if someone clicks the wrong bell or the guy in the witch's mansion makes the wrong callout by accident and you fail the step, you simply have to reset the order from the beginning. Completing this step will lead you to the final step. The last step of the buried easter egg that is shared by both the Maxis side and the Richthofen side is the sharpshooter step. When I attempted this easter egg with my team, I truly underestimated how difficult this step can be. This step is very easy to explain. There's gonna be four places around the map where almost 20 targets in each location will spawn. So every player has to pick a position and shoot all of their targets in one run. Every single target must be hit in order for this step to be completed. If one person misses one target, 
you have to repeat the step. You have to be positioned in a way where you can see every single target and where they spawn. Because there's always a couple of targets that spawn in a very abstract location that is difficult to see. The reason this is a problem because the game doesn't give you any data whatsoever. The game doesn't tell you which of the targets that you missed or even how many targets did you miss. This could lead to someone being convinced that they hit every single target even though that's just not the case. Here's an example where I was convinced that I hit every single target even though I kept missing this target right here by the mystery box. It's mistakes like that which are the difference between doing this in one attempt or spending 20 minutes trying to complete the step. The numerous resets that this could lead to are definitely infuriating. But man, when you finally finish this step, it is a different feeling of satisfaction. Go. It's all. Got all. I got all. I got all. I got all. Yeah, Let's fucking go! But that ends it for the easter eggs. One thing that I did notice about both of these easter eggs is how they mirror each other. Like for example with the orbs, Richtofen wants you to charge them while Maxis wants you to destroy them. Or with the wisp, Richtofen wants you to follow the wisp while Maxis wants you to lead the wisp. Even the time bomb is used differently. Maxis wants you to travel to the past while Richtofen wants you to travel to the future. It really helps in differentiating the two sides and characterizing each of them. But obviously nothing does that better than the super easter egg. Either Maxis or Richtofen will take over the ether depending on which side of the easter eggs you've done. If you've done the Richtofen side, Maxis will be erased from the ether. But if Maxis wins, he puts Richtofen's soul in one of the zombies, destined to die over and over and over again. And that ends Jimmy Zielinski's story and Buried as a whole. Buried is a map that is designed to make you feel overpowered, where every single new feature caters to this design. And while that concept can be quite quite appealing at times, the absence of difficulty can definitely affect the enjoyment of the map. Let's start this section off with a question. What is Call of Duty Zombies biggest achievement? When you really think about it, a lot of maps can be the answer to this question. First off, there's the Reese, the map that constructed the base map design for most future Zombies maps. Then there's Kino der Toten, the map that made the game mode explode in popularity. There's also the Reisendrak, the most well-received map in Zombies history. And finally, there's the Machine, the map that did the impossible task of salvaging whatever Black Ops 4 had left. But I think there is one map that achieved something greater than all of these maps, and that's Origins' influence. Origins was Jason Blundell's commitment to the format that Mob of the Dead introduced, and Origins took that format and finalized its presence into the game mode. It influenced future maps to have a more complex narrative and gameplay, and it added so many new innovations that are still being emulated today. Let's begin with Origins' story. In World War I, the German scientist group 935, led by Ludwig Maxis, set up an excavation site in France. The purpose of this excavation site is to find ancient forces that could help them win the war. With what they've discovered, they managed to create many powerful weapons, one of which is 1,000 foot robots that run on autopilot. With all of the things that they created with these discoveries, they wanted more. And they eventually discovered something that was never meant to be discovered and that is zombies. Zombies then took over the entire excavation site. Three soldiers were then sent to this excavation site to investigate what happened. These three soldiers were the American Tank Dempsey, the Russian Nikolai Belinsky, and the Japanese Takeo Masaki. All three of them proceed to link up together with the German scientist Edward Richthofen, who is shown to be chopping the head of Maxis. The cutscene ends with the robots stomping on the building that they're at, and then the map starts immediately after. Like Mob of the Dead, the power switch mechanic has been removed in favor of something else. Origins introduces the six conversion generators. Turning on one of the conversion generators 
will start a lockdown where you get ambushed by Templar zombies. You have to hold off these Templar zombies for around 10 seconds until the generator is fully turned on. Once the lockdown is completed, the generator will power up everything within the local area. The first item it powers up is the mystery box location within the area, which is weird because normally the box doesn't require power, but in this map that was oddly changed. But anyway, the second thing that the generators can power up is perk machines. And finally, the last thing that generators can power up is the Wonder Fizz machine. The Wonder Fizz machine will dispense a random perk for 1500 points. The Wonder Fizz can dispense perks that are already on the map, like Quick Revive and Speed Cola, but it can also dispense perks that you can't find anywhere else like PhD and Deadshot. And similar to the box, if you use the Wonder Fizz enough times, it will move to another location. These are the rewards that you are given for turning on a single generator. However, your reward for turning on every single generator on the map is Pack-a-Punch. With that in mind, starting up every single conversion generator becomes your main priority in the beginning of the match. It's a very simple process for Pack-a-Punch that a lot of people can figure out, but don't take its simplicity for ease. This map can be fucking relentless. One of the reasons that Origins can be so difficult is that there are so many factors to it that by themselves they don't do much, but then when they compile together, they can throw you off. First of which is spacing. There are a lot of areas on this map that look very spacious at first, but then you realize when you're training on them that they're not as spacious as you thought they were. One good example of this is generator 3. You have the generator area here as well as the crater by your side, and then you also have the area below. Looks like a lot of room to train in, but there are so many factors here that throw you off. The first of which is the zombie spawns. The generator area has one zombie spawn in each side. You can get very overwhelmed by the sheer amount of zombies there. And the area itself isn't completely spacious, there are a lot of things that block your way. Mainly the generator itself with its two supporting legs. And if you happen to get overwhelmed by the zombies and you want to leave the area, you have one of two very narrow pathways. You can go to the crater itself, which is very spacious, but it is filled with mud, and that mud slows your movement down by 50%. The other route you can take is to go down in the trenches, which is very narrow in itself. With all of these things together, if you're not paying attention, you will go down. Then there's the point rationing on this map. It's not a map where you can spend your points recklessly and get away with it. The reason why is because of this guy. Just look at the sky and see how he drops. Hold on. What is he? Oh, shit. What is him? Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? What was that? This is a panzer. He is guaranteed to spawn on round 8 every single game. And if you're not ready for him when round 8 comes, you will likely die. First of all, the panzer is incredibly tanky. Meaning if you have point weapons like an MP40 or an AK-74U, they won't do that much damage to him. He is also equipped with a flamethrower that he uses when you get too close. And while you're shooting him, you have to make sure to dodge his claw attacks so that he doesn't bring you closer to him and use his flamethrower at you. With all of this at his disposal, the panzer is basically capable of handling any situation. So dealing with him quickly becomes paramount. And as I said before, to deal with him effectively, you need to know when to use your points. There's a lot of ways that you can choose from to deal with the panzer. You can go through the route of maximizing your points point gain and get a pack a punched weapon to deal with him. You can go through the luck route and hit the box and see if you can get a good weapon. And you can go the skill route of relying on claymores, which are surprisingly effective against them. It's pretty difficult to pull this off at first, but once you get used to it, it's not that bad. But regardless of the route that you take, the looming threat of this mini boss is indented in your soul from the beginning of the match. So from the very beginning of the match, you have to be efficient at gaining points. You have to be smart enough with your points to know what doors to buy, what guns to buy, what perks to buy, when to buy these things. And on top of all of that, you have to be aware of your surroundings and position yourself carefully so that you don't die unexpectedly. From the very beginning of the match, you're pretty much on edge the entire time until you kill the Panzer. Which makes it so much more rewarding when you finally kill him. The addition of the Panzer definitely made Origins a much more fun experience in the earlier rounds. But what about the high rounds of Origins? What is there to do? First, let's look at the variety of regular weapons. Origins introduces eight new weapons. You have the Ballista, the MP40, the SDG44, the Scar-H, the Scorpion, the KSG, 
the MG-08, and finally, the Mauser. Some of them are pretty weak, like the Ballista and the MP-40, which are mostly used as point weapons, but the rest of the weapons are pretty powerful. Especially the Scar, I forgot how powerful this thing really was, but obviously all of which is outclassed by the Mauser. The Mauser is the first starting room pistol that, when upgraded, doesn't become an explosive weapon. It instead shoots lasers akin to that of the Raygun Mark II, but it still maintains the ridiculous strength of of an upgraded pistol. This thing is pretty effective even in the 40s. Not only is it very powerful against zombies, but it's actually a very useful weapon for mobility. If you continuously shoot the Mauser and jump at the same time, you will gradually get more knockback speed. Granted, this can waste a lot of your ammo, but the amount of time that you can save by doing this is monumental. And on top of all of that, the Mauser is one of the best guns on the map to kill the Panzer. But there is more than just regular weapons. This is the 1 inch punch. A Acquired by filling up 4 soul chests around the map. It allows you to punch zombies and send them flying away. And it also does splash damage. You can hit multiple zombies at the same time. And if sending zombies flying with your fists isn't cool enough, you can choose to drop a fucking airstrike at them. This is a G-Strike, a variant of the monkey bomb that, as I said, literally drops an airstrike at the zombies. Like the one in Inch Pudge, the process to getting the G-Strike is very simple. You go to Generator 2 and pick up one of the four stone slabs on this table. Then you go to Generator 6 and baptize your stone with holy water and melee kills. Once you get enough melee kills, your stone will now be free of sin and you have to take it back to Generator 2. And you have to do this without stepping on mud. Once you take it back to Generator 2, you get more melee kills and you finally get it. It's better to get the one inch punch first before going for the G-Strike to make it a much easier process, but if you don't want to do that, you can just simply get a shield and you will be completely fine. The final thing I want to talk about before going into the staffs and the easter egg is the dig sites. Around the entirety of the map, there are a bunch of these dig sites. In order to interact with these dig sites, you need to pick up one of the four shovels around the map. Interacting with these dig sites can result in many different things. Sometimes it will give you a power up, sometimes it gives you weapons, and sometimes it will give you a bad reward, like grenades. At first glance, the dig sites look like a simple mechanic that could either give you a good reward or a bad reward. But interacting with enough of these dig sites will give you a golden shovel, which increases your odds of getting better loot. And there's still more than just that. Every time you use the golden shovel, you have a chance of getting the golden helmet, which negates all damage from the robot's feet. And if you happen to be in zombie blood, you could occasionally find red dick sites. Interacting with these red dick sites will give you a free perk slot. And speaking of perk slots, there are 9 perks on this map to choose from. And using these red dick sites, you have the ability to get all of them. With everything that I've mentioned so far, you can see how innovative this map really was. But what is considered to be the most innovative thing this map introduced was the four wonder weapon system. In previous maps where there was only one wonder weapon available, there was a lot of infighting between the team. There would be a competition of who would get the wonder weapon first. The reason that's the case is because wonder weapons are an integral part of the zombies experience. So it would always be unfortunate when only one person gets to have that experience and the rest of the people don't. Origins attempt attempted to fix this issue by introducing the four elemental staves. Staves include the Staff of Ice, the Staff of Fire, the Staff of Wind, and the Staff of Lightning. Each staff has its own quest that requires four different parts, but each quest challenges you in a different way. The Ice Staff requires you to conserve your dick sites until a snow round comes in. Once the snow round comes in, you have to keep digging up dick sites until you find three different parts. Each part is located in a certain area. There is one in the trenches, one in the excavation site, and one in the church. Each of the wind staff parts are located in the robot's heads, and in order to get inside the robot's head, you have to shoot the glowing foot of the robot. What makes the wind staff challenging is only one foot is glowing, and it can only tell which foot is glowing when the robot is very close to you. So let's say you want to go inside the robot that passes through generator 2 and 3. If you happen to be at the wrong side and you don't realize that quick enough, 
you will completely miss the robot. And if you miss the robot, you have to wait for multiple robot rotations, which takes quite a while. So the challenge of the wind staff is timing and patience. The lightning staff requires you to be good at parkour. There are three ledges around the map that require you to use the tank to get on top of them. So while riding the tank, you have to perfectly time your jumps in order to get into these ledges and pick up your lightning staff pieces. The fire staff is the most obscure one out of the four because it doesn't require a particular challenge. By simply progressing through the map, the fire staff more so makes itself. You get one part by killing a panzer, one part by turning on generator 6, and one part by shooting up a glowing plane. The final part of every single staff is the respective crystal. In order to get any of these crystals, you require the gramophone as well as the gramophone disc of the respective staff. Then you go to the tunnel named after the respective staff and open up a portal using the gramophone. Once the the portal is constructed, you can now use it to go to the crazy place. You can then pick up the crystal of the respective staff and then go to the main chamber and construct your staff. As for the staffs themselves, let's look at what they can do. The ice staff shoots snowballs that slow zombies down and can barely kill them by around 10. It is easily the weakest out of the four. The wind staff blasts all zombies out of your way up until round 23 where it stops being a one-shot kill. The fire and lightning basically do the exact same thing. You can basically consider them as explosive weapons. The difference is that the lightning staff shoots faster and has more ammo, while the fire staff affects more zombies per shot and does more damage per shot. And I would say that because of that, these two are probably the best out of the four. But it really doesn't matter because all of them basically drop off by around 25. But there is more to the staffs than just that. Each of them can be upgraded. The upgrade quests for these staffs require a bunch of puzzle solving. The puzzles themselves aren't particularly difficult, but they're very unintuitive. There's no particular pattern that you could recognize or learn from them. Like, for example, let's look at this fire staff one. In the lower floor of the church, there's going to be these torches that are numbered from 4 to 11. You have to shoot four of these torches in a specific order. To get the numbers that you need, you have to go to the second floor of the church and look at four symbols that are glowing. Each symbol corresponds to a certain number, which is going to be the torch that you shoot. So you figure out the numbers that correspond to these four symbols and then shoot them and you finish the step. If you look at the symbols, you can see that there's no pattern to them. Here, take a look. The third symbol has one filled out circle and one open circle. And then the fourth symbol has two filled out circles. Naturally, from this, I would assume that if there was two symbols and both of them have the exact same amount of circles, but one of them has one open circle and the other one has all filled out circles, that means that the one with the open circle is the lower number. Now that we have concluded that, let's look at the other symbols. Here's another two symbols. Both of them have the exact same number of circles, but this one has two open circles. Naturally, I would assume that this is the lower number, but unfortunately for me, that is completely wrong. As I was saying, it's unintuitive and inconsistent, and because of that, you have to resort to either guessing the code or looking it up online. It's not like I am saying that I want the ultimate staffs to be handed out to me. Like say for example, reducing the entire upgrade process into just putting the thing in the pack-a-punch machine. But I think what would have been the best way to go at this is to make it so that the upgrade process expands upon the quests of the base staffs. Let's look at the lightning staff for example. The quest to getting the base lightning staff requires parkour. What if the upgrade process expands upon that idea? For example, you'd have a long and difficult parkour course in the crazy place that you can do. I think a lot of people would enjoy doing that more than the piano step and the switches. But if I'm being honest, I can still forgive the upgrade processes because the staffs, for the most part, are pretty strong. The ultimate staffs maintain their original shot from the base variant, but it also gets two new bonuses, the first of which is being able to use the the back end of the staffs to revive teammates. But the important one is the additional bonus of a charge shot. The lightning staff's charge shot shoots an electrical orb on the ground. Any zombie that comes close to this electrical orb will be electrified by it and eventually killed. Out of every charge shot, this one is by far the weakest. You notice that in the late 30s that it does kill, but it kills so slowly that it's not worth using compared to the other staffs. The wet staff's charge shot shoots a tornado that drags any zombie close to it, and all zombies that get dragged into this tornado get fucking disintegrated. While this staff is much better than the lightning, it still has its 
own a couple of issues. The main issue with it is how inconsistent it is. Sometimes the tornado will only kill like five or six zombies, and other times it will turn the entire horde into a pile of ash. It's also worth noting that this staff has the least amount of ammo compared to the others, which adds to its inconsistency problem. I think out of every single staff, the wind staff is by far the one that needs the most amount of skill. The fire staff's charge shot shoots a pool of lava at the ground, and any zombie that steps into this pool of lava will die. This staff is moderately good at everything. It's great for holding out areas, it's great for killing a lot of zombies, it has a lot of ammo too, and it's probably the best staff at killing the panzers. But what is without question the best staff out of the four is the ice staff, and it's not even close. The ice staff's charge shot shoots a large blizzard on the ground, and this blizzard is basically a giant fuck you area denial attack. This is still one of the strongest wonder weapons ever created to date. It's basically a trap that is condensed within a weapon, and it has a lot of ammo too. Granted, the blizzard itself takes a couple of seconds to manifest, so in order to use it defensively, you have to predict moments before they happen, but it's so good offensively that that doesn't matter at all. The ice staff is so good on this map that if you're playing solo, most of the time, there is no other point in getting any other staff. Well, that is if you're not planning to do the easter egg. And speaking of which, let's now talk about the easter egg of Origins. As I mentioned in the beginning, Origins is set in World War 1, and taking the stage is a younger version of the Black Ops 1 cast, which are Dempsey, Nikolai, Takio, and Richtofen. As these characters try to survive the onslaught of zombies, they start hearing voices of a little girl begging for help. We later find out that this girl is Samantha Maxis, who came from the dimension of Buried. It turns out that the Victus crew helped out Maxis instead of Richtofen in canon, meaning that the Richtofen side super easter egg was just a what if scenario. Now, a lot happens between Buried and Origins, so let me summarize it as much as I can. When Maxis took control of the Aether, he was corrupted by it, and Samantha's soul at the time was in Richtofen's body in Moon. Maxis then took Samantha's soul to Agartha so he can reunite with her, but Samantha says no and fucks off to another dimension. That dimension happens to be the one where Origins takes place. She then tries to get in contact with the Maxis of this dimension so that he can free her from Agartha. Maxis of the new dimension agrees to this, but then he dies, so she instead tries to contact the other four Primus characters. Saving Samantha is the easter egg of Origins. I've always wondered what would have happened if Origins took a more grounded approach and focused on World War 1 instead of saving Samantha. Having a larger focus on these groups that experimented with Element 115 like Broken Arrow, Group 935, and Division 9. But anyway, I'm getting off topic, let's go back to the easter egg. In my old Origins video, I mentioned that this was one of my least favorite favorite easter eggs from the ones that I did back then. At the time, I only did 7 easter eggs, which was this one plus the Black Ops 3 main easter eggs. But now I've done 20 more easter eggs from Black Ops 2, Black Ops 4, and Cold War. And now I have more easter eggs to compare to this one. So, has my opinion changed much on this easter egg? The answer to that is not really. Let's quickly explain each step one by one. Step one is secure the keys, where you have to get every single staff and upgrade them. The second step, Ascent from Darkness, requires you to put the four staffs in four different staff holders. At least that was how it was intended to work. In Black Ops 2, there's a glitch that you can use to skip the step entirely. You have to put the fire staff in the fire staff holder four times in a row, and you you completely skip the step. It's a good thing that this glitch exists, otherwise the easter egg would be significantly worse. The rest of the staff holders are in the robot's heads, and the way that it works is that all of the robots come by together, but only one of them will have a glowing foot. So you would have had to wait for at least three robot rotations in order to complete this step. The robots stay on the map for about a minute and a half, and they disappear for another minute and a half, so that would have probably taken 10 minutes at the very least. But thankfully, because of this glitch, this step only takes less than 30 seconds to complete. The third step, Rainfire, requires you to go inside the robots' heads and push this red button right here. Once you do that, you have a limited amount of time to throw the G-Strike at this area right here. Throwing the G-Strike quickly within the time limit will complete the step. The fourth step, Unleash the Horde, requires you to throw the Maxis Drone at this destroyed seal. The Maxis Drone will then release 10 Panzers from this hole that you have to kill, and killing them all will finish the step. The next step, which is Skewer the Winged Beast, requires you to go into zombie blood and shoot this glowing plane in the sky. Once you do that, there's gonna be 
a zombie roaming around the excavation site that you have to kill. Killing this zombie will give you your max stone back and you finish the step. Next step is wield the fist of iron. You have to go to the main chamber and punch these Templar zombies that have smoke emitting from them. Eventually you'll get a stone slab and finish the step. The last step, raise hell, requires you to take all four of the stabs and put them in the four pedestals in the crazy place. Once you do that, you have to get 100 kills with your normal weapons until your screen flashes white. From there, you take the Maxis drone and put it in the middle of the crazy place. And from there, you finally achieve freedom and finish the egg. The easter egg for the most part is pretty straightforward and it even has a couple of fun steps here and there. Like for example, when you kill all of the 10 panzers or holding off in the main chamber or getting all of these kills in the crazy place. These are pretty fun steps. But what makes me despise this easter egg is the first step secure the keys. The step where you have to upgrade every single staff. Each ultimate staff requires four steps. The first step is to do a task in the crazy place. The second step is to do a task in the excavation site. The third step is to go to the main chamber and align the rings to the respective staff. And finally, the last step is to put the staff in its respective pedestal in the crazy place and get a bunch of kills to charge it up. Every single player can only hold one staff at a time, which isn't that much of a problem when you're playing four player but in solo this is one of the most tedious steps of all time if not the most tedious and that is against some strong competition the reason why it's so tedious is because you have to upgrade every single staff upgrading a single staff is tedious but it's tolerable because at least in that case you're going for the staff that you want but in the case of the easter egg i have to upgrade every single one of them despite the fact that i don't even have to use any of them for the easter egg and that is without mentioning the amount of things that can slow down this process. You have the mud that slows you down by 50%. You have the Templar zombies that occasionally disrupt your generators and you have to go out of your way to kill them so you can progress through this easter egg. And the map travel on this map is terrible. The only form of map travel that you have is the crazy place teleporters. If you're within the crazy place, you can teleport to one of the four tunnels around the map. But if you want to go to the crazy place, you need to have a gramophone with you and put it in one of the tunnels. Tunnels. But if you place the gramophone, you can't take it with you to the crazy place. So let's say for example, you want to go from generator 1 to generator 6. You would place the gramophone in the fire tunnel by spawn. So you put the gramophone in the fire tunnel and use it to get into the crazy place. Then you use the ice teleporter to go to the ice staff tunnel by generator 6. And now you made your shortcut to the other side of the map. Fantastic. But there's a problem. The problem is that your gramophone is all the way back in generator 1. So in order to get it back, you have to run around the entire map on foot just to get it back. And there's these occasional times where you put the gramophone in a certain tunnel and then you forget to pick it back up and you don't realize that you forgot it until you're in a completely different tunnel. That is by far one of the most infuriating things that could happen while you're doing this easter egg. The way that it should have worked is that there would be one gramophone in each tunnel and you just put the discs there and the teleporters will always be on and ready to be used. The decision to make it so that there is only one gramophone that you can use was such a terrible idea. It genuinely stagnates the entire pace of this map and nowhere is this more felt than in this step of the easter egg. This step is menial, monotonous, and painstakingly time consuming. But what truly makes this step much worse is that it takes up over 75% of the easter egg. The bulk of the entire easter egg is one of the most tedious steps in the franchise. And it's really why this easter egg overstays its welcome very quickly for me. The rest of the steps are not that bad. There is the rain fire step which works much differently in solo than in co-op. In order to do this step solo, the middle robot has to be the one with the glowing foot because you're not given that much time as a solo player to do this step. Because of this, the step is heavily reliant on luck. So sometimes you will get it in your first rotation and you can quickly end this step. And sometimes you will go through multiple robot rotations where the middle robot doesn't have a glowing foot. An example of this happened in one of my live streams. I shit you not, I had 14 robot rotations in a row 
where the middle robot did not have a glowing foot. But that sort of thing never happens this often, so it doesn't ruin the easter egg for me. The first step of the easter egg already did that. I genuinely wish the easter egg only required one staff to be upgraded instead of all four of them. Since as I mentioned before, if you're going for one staff only, it's the staff that you want to use for the rest of the game. The step as a result will be shorter and more tolerable. However, despite all of my complaints, there is one thing that I have to give this easter egg credit for. This map was the catalyst to make future easter eggs accessible to all types of players. Maps no longer require a certain amount of players to complete easter eggs, and Origins is part of the reason of why that is the case. And for that I have a lot of respect for this easter egg. But all in all, that was Origins. I may have complained a lot about this map in this video, but I have to acknowledge what this map achieved. It honestly astounds me how relevant this map has remained for the past 9 years. It really proved that the influence Origins had on Call of Duty Zombies was insurmountable. Despite its disastrous launch, Black Ops 2 remained to be tenacious throughout its entire life cycle. Every single map tried out new ideas and concepts, even if some of these ideas caused the game setbacks. Transit was a large-scale behemoth filled with new content like survival maps and game modes. Die Rise was an attempt to incorporate parkour into Call of Duty Zombies with things like its vertically inclined design and the trample steam. Mob of the Dead expanded the narrative and made it co inside with your gameplay, turning zombies into a movie-like experience. Buried gave the players freedom and control over how the map played by providing new features like chalk drawings. And finally, Origins added so many layers of complexity to the gameplay with things like the ultimate staffs. Every single map tried something out, and that's why Black Ops 2 is the anomaly of Call of Duty Zombies. Before I end this video, let me do a quick ranking of these maps from worst to best. The worst map in this game for me is Bus Depot. It's just too constrained to be fun. Next up is Transit. Trying to do anything on this map is just a chore and I hate it. Next up is Farm. Farm is a way more fun survival map than Bus Depot and is more fun to play than Transit, but there's still not that much to do other than gain perks. Next up is Town. Town is basically Farm with the Pack-a-Punch, so it's significantly better than that. Next up though is Nuketown. I think Nuketown is better than Town because in my opinion I would rather have random perk spawns than Lava because at least with the random perk spawns they're only a thing for the first 20 rounds while the lava is a thing permanently for the rest of the game. Plus, I love the challenge that Nuketown provides. It's one of my favorite maps to train on in Zombies. Next up, we have my least favorite DLC in this game, excluding Nuketown, and that is Mob of the Dead. The only reason I ever come back to Mob of the Dead is because of its storytelling. And while the storytelling on Mob of the Dead is a masterpiece, the gameplay is way too repetitive for me to come back to it a lot. Next up after Mob of the Dead is Buried. I don't have a notable issue with Buried. I I love the easter eggs on this map, the gameplay is also pretty solid, but I just find the other two maps to be a bit more fun to play. Next up is my most controversial pick on this ranking and that's Die Rise. The reason I put Die Rise this high is mainly because of its high rounds. The setup process is very simple and fast, the liquefier is one of the best wonder weapons in this game, and there are so many strategies that you can do on this map that are a lot of fun. But what I believe is the best map in this game has to be Origins. I think in the large scale of the entire game mode, Origins is a bit overrated, but in terms of comparing it with other Black Ops 2 maps, it's easily the best. Out of every single map, it has the highest amount of content, it has the best regular weapons, it has some of the best wonder weapons in the series. The only major complaint that I really have about Origins is its easter egg. I don't like doing it, but it's not really such a major component that it ruins the entire map for me. But uh, yeah, I don't have anything left to say. The video is over. You, you can go now.